Good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. I'm Councilmember Adrienne Adams, the chair of this subcommittee. We're joined today by Council Members Ku and Chin. Today, we will be hearing pre-considered LU, Haven Green Senior Housing, an application submitted by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development for development of a site in the Little Italy neighborhood of Manhattan in Council Member Margaret Chin's district, which is the only site in Community Board 2 currently controlled by HPD. Specifically, the application is for disposition of city-owned property at 199-207 Elizabeth Street, Mott Street, Block 493, Lot 30, and sale of this disposition area to the project sponsor. This application presents us with the difficult process of balancing two of the most critical issues currently facing our city. The need to balance access to green space and access to affordable housing for our most vulnerable populations. All members of this subcommittee and the City Council are aware of the complexity involved when dealing with these issues and look forward to hearing testimony from advocates of both sides. The approvals that HPD is seeking would facilitate the development of a new seven-story building with 123 LGBTQ-friendly affordable units for seniors, approximately 6,700 square feet of public open space, nonprofit office space, a community room, and storefront commercial space. Haven Green will offer on-site supportive services to all building residents in partnership with Riseboro, Sage NYC, and Habitat for Humanity NYC. Before I call on HPD and the development team to testify on this application, I would like to invite Council Member Chin to provide remarks. Thank you, Chair Adam. Thank you for providing me with an opportunity to speak about this land use application in my council district. The path to this hearing has been a long one. For decades, this site in Little Italy has been promised as the future home of affordable housing. With this application, I believe our city is finally delivering on that promise. This project will create over 100 units of deeply affordable housing for elderly New Yorkers including members of our city's LGBTQ community and the formerly homeless. I will all, it will also create permanent green space that I hope will be mapped as city park land under the management of the Parks Department. Almost every day, I hear from seniors who are struggling to get by. It may be hard for some of us to imagine what it's like to worry about where you are going to live next year, next month, or even next week. But that is the reality for tens of thousands of New Yorkers. These New Yorkers might not be able to afford to hire lobbyists or consultants to create sleek marketing campaigns or recruit celebrities to their cause. Their struggles are mostly out of public view and their voices are not always heard. But I hear them and I know there are many in this room that hear them too. Opponents of this project hold a passionate point of view regarding the future of this site. It pains me to disagree with them, especially when I know that we all want what is best for our community. However, I speak regularly with seniors who fully support this effort to bring more safe, accessible, and affordable housing to the people of our city. They want to know when it will be ready, telling them that now is not the time and that this city-owned lot is not the place is unacceptable. The depth of the affordability crisis requires an all-in approach to maximize the public benefits of public resources. We will need more affordable projects, not fewer. Fair and equitable housing calls for all neighborhoods in our city to participate in alleviating this crisis. 
I thank you, Chair Adam, and the members of this committee for their consider, uh, consideration of this application, and I look forward to hearing all the testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chin. We now call on panel for HPD, Lacey Tauber, Leela Bozorg, Karen Haycox, Scott Short, and Dylan Sammons. You're here. Welcome. Council, please swear in the panel. Please state your name before answering. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Uh, Leila Bozerg, yes, I do. Lacey Tauber, yes. You gotta press the buttons. Karen Haycox, yes. Scott. Scott Short, yes. Dylan Salmons, yes. Thank, thank you. you all very much for being here today. You may begin. All right. Thank you, Chair and Council Members, uh, for your time today. So uh, this land use application is related to um, an urban land use uh, review process, a ULERP application, seeking an Article 11 disposition approval for a city-owned lot located at 199 to 207 Elizabeth Street in Manhattan Council District 2 for a project known as Haven Green. The Haven Green site is composed of several lots that were acquired by the city through deed and condemnation between 1853 and 1930. In 1991, prior to HPD assuming management jurisdiction of the property, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, leased the property to a neighboring property owner on a month-to-month -month basis. This lease allowed that tenant to use the property for any as-of-right use, including storing sculptures. The lease stipulated that the tenant must vacate the property upon 30 days written notice from the city. DCAS transferred jurisdiction of the property to HPD in 2018. Given the tremendous need for affordable housing in core Manhattan and the extremely limited number of public sites, the city made a commitment to develop affordable housing on this site in 2012 as part of an agreement regarding the Seward Park Essex Crossing development in the Lower East Side. HPD issued the Mott Elizabeth Streets RFP, the RFP, in September 2016. It required that respondents propose a high-quality, mixed-use, affordable housing development to include affordable senior housing, quality commercial and or community facility uses, and a creative design to ensure at least 5,000 square feet of publicly accessible open space that would be reserved for community use. The RFP also noted that the site is located in the Special Little Italy District, or the SLID, which was established in 1977 with the goals of preserving and strengthening the historic and cultural character of the community. The selected development team, which includes Penrose, Riseboro, and Habitat for Humanity, submitted a proposal that met these requirements, complied with the terms of the SLID, and exceeded the minimum open space requirement by including 8,400 square feet of publicly accessible open space including 6,700 square feet open to the sky and 1,700 square feet of covered entryway. The project will be developed under HPD's Senior Affordable Rental Apartments, or SARA, program and is deeply affordable, targeting seniors with incomes from 30 to 60 percent of the area median income, AMI, which amounts to an annual income of approximately $21,930 to $43,860 for an individual based on 2018 AMI levels. As is customary, HPD and the developer will enter into a regulatory agreement to memorialize the project's affordability and other restrictions. The regulatory agreement will have a 60-year term and will require that all units will be rent stabilized even after the regulatory agreement expires. 30% of the units will be set aside for homeless seniors referred by the Department of Homeless Services, DHS. The newly constructed building will be seven stories tall with 123 age-friendly studio apartments and on-site supportive services. Resident amenities will include laundry facilities, an exercise room, computer room, common room, an outdoor landscape terrace, and supportive services offices with LGBT-friendly senior services to be provided to residents and the community by SAGE. The building also includes community facility space for Habitat for Humanity and ground floor retail. Haven Green will be built to passive house standards, which is the gold standard in energy and resource efficient building design. The project will include publicly accessible open space to be, to be maintained in perpetuity through restrictions included in the property disposition agreements and in the regulatory agreement. These restrictions will run with the land. The open space will be designed based on input that the Haven Green development team collected through their public engagement process. The team engaged community members, gardeners, and other local stakeholders 
in a series of participatory design sessions to obtain public input on the activities, design elements, and character of the space with the goal of creating a high quality open space that is grounded in community input and meets community needs. The Haven Green Project will be an LGBTQ friendly senior development and a welcome home for many seniors who have been waiting years to have the opportunity to apply for an affordable housing unit. Therefore, HPD is before the council seeking approval of this land use action to facilitate the development of a multi-use development called Haven Green to provide much needed affordable housing for seniors. And I'll turn it over to the development team to walk you through their presentation. Thank you, Lacey. Thank you, members of council and the subcommittee for having us here today to hear about Haven Green. My name is Dylan Sommons. I'm representing the development team comprised of three very experienced and long-standing members of both the affordable housing, property management, and home building community. Um, Penrose is lead developer for our three uh, member team, is located uh, in New York City here. We have experience for over 45 years de delivering high quality, exceptional uh, affordable housing and open space communities uh, with having 16,000 units developed in our, 20, in our over 200 properties. Our partner here at Riseboro Community Partnership is both a co-developer in the creation of Haven Green, a provider of high quality supportive services, and the project's property manager. They have over 45 years of experience into themselves as well in New York City, beginning in 1973, and also have a, a, a large number of units developed and currently under their management um, and stewardship. Habitat for Humanity New York City is another one of our co-developer partners and also the ground floor tenant. Habitat has also 30 plus years of experience in New York City, has built hundreds of affordable homes uh, and preserved as well, and has a long standing history in this community having begun their, their initial stewardship with mascot flats. The general timeline of the project as Lacey went through, the project was identified for affordable housing in 2012. The site was open at limited hours to the public in 2013. In December of 2017, HPD selected the, the Penrose, Riseboro, and Habitat for Humanity team. And in September of 2018 into the fall, we led four participatory designs in order to uh, solicit and garner feedback for the eventual opening of the public space that would be behind Haven Green. In November, we certified the project into ULERP and the public review process began. In December of 2018, we had our CB2 review and recommendation period, which was ultimately disapproved. In February of 2019, we had the Manhattan Barrow President Review and Recommendation Period, which was approved with conditions. In March and April of 2019, CPC reviewed and had their voting period, upon which the project received unanimous approval. We are currently in the City Council Review and Recommendation Period. Haven Green is at once trying to accomplish several things. Affordable housing for 123 seniors of New York City, uh, provision of high quality open and public space, community facility space to provide services for those um, who are most underserved and have the smallest voice in the room, uh, and also provide opportunities for increasing the retail uh, tapestry along Elizabeth Street. For the affordable uh, housing for seniors component of this project, in CB2 alone, there are over 4,600 seniors awaiting affordable housing with an average wait time of over seven years. Since 2014, only 93 new units of, 20, of affordable housing have been constructed in the community board. And the site designated for Haven Green is the only developable site within CB2 that is controlled by HPD. Of the 123 unit rental units that will be in Haven Green, 100% are affordable at or below 60% of the area median income with greater than half of the project below extremely low incomes, which is 30% of the area median. Beyond housing, Haven Green will offer on-site supportive services tailored to meet the needs of an aging population, as well as those LGBTQ identifying community members. The project will leverage the depths of experience from Riseboro, Habitat for Humanity, and Sage New York City, along with the many other non-for-profit and community members who have been our supporters all along. Supports will be offered from a breadth of, of services, including entitlement and advocacy, wellness, and connectivity. As a neighborhood asset, Haven Green will offer a diverse array of public open space, both open space to the sky, covered open space from the, elephant, from the elements, and over 600 square feet of space that will be um, uh, offered through Habitat as a community asset for nonprofit entities to use. 
Uh, as far as community engagement, as stated in the summer and fall of 2018, we led an inclusive participatory design process to, collect, to collectively imagine the future of the open space at Haven Green. The process was designed to be open, inclusive, accessible, and engaging, and provide an opportunity for a wide range of stakeholders to participate and provide input, which was ultimately gathered into a participatory design report that's hosted on the Haven Green community website. For the residential features of Haven Green, uh, there are over 123 affordable apartments. There are common laundries at each floor, allowing residents to, to co-mingle with their neighbors and, and escape, uh, escape reclusiveness of their own apartment. There's an 1,100 square foot community room on the second floor that opens into a roof terrace, so a diverse array of programming, 365 days a year for residents of the project. There'll be a 300 square foot supportive service space, which will be shared by the supportive service providers provide case management, and including a designated case management office. And as mentioned, the site is designed to passive house standards for the highest levels of energy efficiency. The commercial space along, along Elizabeth Street is partitioned into small scale, uh, neighborhood scale retail. And the community facility space spans the ground floor at the rear of the project and 5,200 5, square feet and also has cellar level space. The community facility will be leased to Habitat for Humanity in New York City offering again 600 square foot meeting room available to neighboring groups and local nonprofits, as well as Sage NYC. The ground floor of the building program fronts Elizabeth Street. The tan is identified as the small scale retail and commercial space. The blue is the punctuated residential lobby served by elevators for the aging seniors. And then towards the rear of the ground floor is the lease space for Habitat for Humanity New York City and Sage NYC. You'll see towards the far uh, right left-hand side is the demarcated space. It will be reservable for not-for-profit entities. Zoning analysis. The project is consistent with zoning regulations, including the Little Lily Special District requirements. The design's been reviewed and certified by the Department of City Planning. The height restriction imposed is, can, is in alignment with the Little Lily Special District requirements. It is seven stories with a total building height of just about 75 feet. And the, the building design is underneath the maximum floor area ratio of the permitted 4.1 with a floor area ratio of 3.72. Of the lot, 34% is open to the sky. The building mass itself is centered towards the northern portion of the site with an intention to create as much open space for solar access as possible. The site offers access both from Mott Streets and Elizabeth Streets and will be open to the public continuously year round. The current site design is laid out as part of the initial RFP response and is yet to be updated to reflect the design strategies, goals, and uh, features identified in the participatory design response. The northern portion of the site that's shown here is the second floor roof terrace. The site at no time becomes a private backyard for the residents or community tenants or retail tenants of Haven Green. And so the space is just for tenants in the evening. A couple renderings here that describe the architectural quality of the building, uh, replicating the unique masonry material shown along Elizabeth Street. Architectural details is vertical coining and the horizontal masonry rows, emblematic of some of the other architecture around the street. There's a continuous metal banding, uh, reminiscent also of the, of the iron facades along the street. And then there's the gratuitous kind of open uh, breezeway that flows towards the rear end of the site. Closer up view of the entryway and breezeway. Condition in the breezeway space, heading towards the public open space with access to the community facility space to the right. An illustrative view of the critical mass of open space surrounded by public gardening and other features that are identified in the participatory design response. And I think I'm going to hand it over to Scott Shorge, who's going to give a few remarks to the development team. Thank you again. Thank you, Dylan. Um, and thank you, Council Committee. My name is Scott Short. I'm the CEO of Riseboro Community Partnership, one of the co-developers, service provider, and property manager for Haven Green. Um, you've heard about the merits of the project from Dylan, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the philosophical underpinnings that brought this team together to propose this project. Um, and those revolve around equity and fairness. Equity and fairness are two big concepts. Equity and fairness are two big concepts that the development team believes in deeply, and I know that belief is shared by everyone on this committee. We believe in it because we see the disparity all around us in this city. 
We see the growing homeless population. We see kids falling behind in low-income neighborhoods. We see longtime residents being displaced. We see seniors forced out of the communities that they helped build, and we want to do something about it. I admire all the steps that this city council has taken to change laws and create new resources to make this city a fairer and more equitable place. The Haven Green Project builds on the legacy that the council has established in promoting these essential ideals. It's rare that you get the opportunity to approve a single project that so clearly advances the principles of equity and fairness. To be able to build housing for some of our poorest, oldest, most vulnerable citizens in one of the wealthiest and most privileged communities in the entire city, while offering publicly accessible open space back to that community as part of the project, is a chance that does not come around very often. I urge you to take advantage of this unique opportunity to advance equity and fairness in our city and vote to approve Haven Green. Thank you. I am Karen Haycock, CEO of Habitat for Humanity New York City. Uh, Habitat for Humanity New York City joined this team because of the opportunity to build housing for a more vulnerable population than we traditionally serve and to make a real impact on fair housing in our city. Haven Green will be built in one of the wealthiest, whitest neighborhoods in the city, a neighborhood that rarely, if ever, sees new affordable housing created. In short, this project on this piece of land in this neighborhood is a matter of social, economic, and racial justice. Habitat New York City knew that a pre-existing conflict existed around this site, one that has separated neighbors and created tension in the neighborhood. We empathize with those who feel passionately about the current space, the, though through our participatory design and ongoing community engagement efforts, we have sought to hear residents and consider their thoughts and opinions. We also listened to the voices of those who were unable to attend participatory design meetings or community board meetings, the low-income and homeless seniors in our city, those who may be confined to fourth-floor walk-up apartments all day long until a relative or caretaker can help them, those who are currently experiencing homelessness, those LGBTQ seniors who, after paving the way for so many and so much social progress, were forced back into the closet for fear of losing their existing housing. Those voices are loud, too. We see this project as a compromise and an opportunity for all stakeholders to come together in service of multiple neighborhood needs. Haven Green will provide more than 123 low-income and formerly homeless seniors with desperately needed affordable homes, which they will utilize 100% of the time and provide the neighborhood with publicly accessible green space. Additionally, we believe the development of the site will provide cumulatively more access to green and open space by square foot once one factors into consideration the hours of access of the current space. We are thrilled to stand beside our development team partners and all of you as we work to build for a, b a better city for every resident in every neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you for being here once again, uh, panel. I do have a few questions for you. What will the hours of operation for the public space be? The hours of operation for the public space will mirror or be longer than those of neighboring surrounding open spaces at no less than nine to five. All right, and who is going to manage the open space? Uh, Riseboro Community Partnership as the property manager will uh, be primarily responsible for the management, but we envision bringing in uh, interested parties from all the community engagement that we've done to help participate in, in the planning, design, and ultimate, ultimate maintenance of that space. What about the Parks Department? We, we can speak to that, actually. Yeah, so I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I think there are uh, a couple uh, issues with working with parks that, you know, we've, we've been in active conversations with them about the possibilities of involvement here. Um, and we think um, that having the development team be the one that manages the space is really the best outcome for a couple of reasons. Um, one, they've done this really extensive outreach process, you know, with the community. They've heard a lot of input about what uh, folks want to see happen in this space, and so they're really well positioned to make sure that the design uh, really reflects that community input. 
And then secondly, in our conversations with parks, um, we've heard that with the resources available to them um, at this time, they're really only able to commit to what they call a roving crew of maintenance, um, which may not be as regular as uh, you know what the development team is able to provide since they're on site and really more able to respond to issues in real time. But I would say you know that we all really share the goal of making sure that this is uh, a very high quality open space that is accessible to this community and really based on you know the input that we've heard from them over the last uh, few months, years. Yeah. And I'll also just add to that that it's really through our financing that we can ensure that the proper financing is in place for long-term maintenance of the park. And we also have uh, legal tools in place that we'll, we'll be employing to ensure that um, it is publicly accessible in perpetuity. Um, so having the development team do it does enable us to bring more resources to, to bear to the management um, than, than we know might be available to parks. Um, and we have a way of actually enforcing that for the long term rather than leaving it up to um, kind of the, the status of the, um, the city's avail availability to finance it. We can actually ensure now when we're financing it that the financing is in place to manage and operate it for the very long term. Okay, so along those lines, can you describe the process for developing the future public open space? What's the process look like? Kind of soup to nuts for all of us to hear it. <laughs> sure. Um, so if the project is successful through its ULERP application, the next steps will be working with HPD Finance and HPD, HPD Program to develop a final site plan for both the building and the, and the open space. Uh, ideally, that plan is completed by, you know, within six to nine months. And then the project would be able to break ground on its construction financing, construct the building and the park, hopefully over a period not to exceed 24 months. Anybody have anything to add to that? That was a quick process. <laughs> a lot of it will, will depend on um, how soon the project's able to move forward. Um, and again, we, we put into our agreements at financial closing um, that we, um, you know, we, we wouldn't fully convey the land until the, the park is, we, we would essentially put it in our land disposition agreement that they would need to complete the park before being able to um, uh, uh, get their TCO. Okay, and what assurance can you give that the public space, the public open space, will indeed remain in perpetuity? I can answer that. Um, we have a number of tools that we use to make sure that um, the agreements we come up with um, are enforceable and in place. Um, so some of those tools that we've used on other projects like this um, is an open space agreement that gets recorded um, with the financial closing. We can put it in the deed. We can create a new restrictive declaration. Um, these are all really powerful legal tools that we um, have used on similar projects to require um, that certain commitments actually are legally recorded um, and in place for the very long term. Um, the way we enforce something like that is that we actually do have things called enforcement notes and enforcement mortgages um, and our regulatory agreement where if anything is violated, we can actually um, in, uh, enforce really high financial penalties. Um, it's usually ca capturing the land value can become that penalty. Um, so there's a huge financial incentive to not violate any of those terms. Okay. Did you explore other configurations for the building mass in order to provide more public open space on site? Um, so, you know, based on the borough president's recommendation, we have looked into, um, you know, what it would take to, to accomplish that. And, you know, I think as an agency, we're very committed to both maintaining the unit count on this site and also the programming. And, you know, the only way that we have uh, been able to uh, see an opportunity to do that would involve violating the zoning provisions that are outlined in the Special Little Lily District. Um, they're actually very prescriptive in terms of what can happen here. And you know any violation of that would require you know a follow-up zoning action, and you know I think also our 
RFP really um, called for projects that were respectful of the SLID because we wanted to make sure that we had a, a project that was respectful of the community character here. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I'll also just add, during the um, competitive request for proposal project, uh, process, one of the things we were looking for is the best proposal that balances these, these two very uh, important needs, the affordable housing and the open space. And so looking at the various configurations of what different teams proposed to us, that was very much um, one of the things, this project, the way that it presented the, the balance of affordable housing and open space, um, uh, did that best relative to the other proposals. Um, as Lacey mentioned, we're open to continuing the conversation about how to make that even stronger, but it has um, serious costs and trade-offs that right now we feel like this is the best balance of a um, of, of strong number of affordable units staying within the special little Italy district zoning um, and providing um, high quality, publicly accessible open space. Okay, thank you. I have w just one more question before I turn it over to my colleagues. What is the uh, nature of the lease with the current tenant? It's, it's um, currently still a month-to-month -month lease. Um, it was a lease that was previously managed by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Um, it was always a month-to-month -month lease. Um, it's now uh, managed by HPD rather than DCAS. Um, and uh, the tenant is, uh, the lease does say that the tenant is required to leave the site um, after given 30 day notice um, by the city when the city needs to take the site back for affordable housing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, colleagues, uh, Councilmember Chin? Did you have a question? Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, HPD, because I know this financing program, the SARA program, is, is for 60 years. So can HPD tell us, like, how can we, you know, extend the affordability? What tools do you have um, to help make sure that that can happen, that the uh, affordability doesn't end um, at 60 years? I know that part of it is keeping it as run, um, stabilized, yeah. and for seniors, hopefully, you know, the scree will continue so there'll be no uh, rent increases, but in terms of what tools HPD have that can help extend the affordability for this building. Sure. So um, we, as you mentioned, uh, there will be an initial 60-year regulatory agreement, um, and we have a couple tools that we plan to use um, as of now for Haven Green. Um, the primary one is how we structure our financing. So we do require, um, uh, our, we're essentially providing a mortgage for the construction um, of, of this project, um, and we have the, the term set up in a way so that there's interest um, growing over time, over those 60 years, on our mortgage. Um, and that becomes a very large balloon payment at the end of that 60 years that the developer is responsible for paying back unless they extend affordability with us. Their tax incentive also expires at the end of that term. So there are very large financial incentives that through practice, and this is essentially how HPD is able to do um, preservation and extended affordability, we've set up the financial incentives for the um, development team, which has um, very strong nonprofit partners that are that are committed to long-term affordability, as is as is Penrose, um, to come back to the table and renegotiate another regulatory agreement um, with new financing. Um, so that's the primary way on a project like this. We also, as I mentioned, we have our enforcement note and enforcement mortgages, um, which the enforcement note captures the value of the land, um, and we can enforce um, the repayment of that if there's any violations during the term of the agreement. Um, the other uh, part of the plan, there is going to be uh, four retail units. Uh, can you talk about this, the retail units affects um, the financing of the affordable senior housing? Sure. So part of the strategy for achieving very low levels of affordability, or deep levels of affordability, I should say, is leveraging the income generation of the retail value of those, those four spaces. So we intend to market them to market rate paying retail tenants. We intend to use that market rate income at its high levels to pay down a larger project-wide mortgage to finance the project rather than relying on the rent of the low-income units. 
But I guess at, at the same time, we are losing a lot of, you know, mom and pop stores, um, neighborhood retails, um, affordable grocery store. I don't think you could find a sewer repair shop um, in that area. Uh, so are you looking at, you know, maybe working to make sure that small businesses, neighborhood business have an opportunity there um, to also be able to operate a business? So that it's not, I don't want to see any more, you know, luxury boutiques and all those things that are in there now. We are absolutely committed to working with HPD to come up with a structure of financing that could balance, you know, the burden on rental income from the residential and the you know, desired need for a diverse amount of retail at the front. Now, in your presentation on the page that says ground floor blocking plan, you have the community facility. So that community facility actually opens up to the public open space? So the rear of the community facility, I don't know if I have a cursor, yeah. This rear space here is a double door that actually leads into this, you know, effective meeting room or boardroom. The idea is that, and this is the space that Habitat for Humanity will administer together with local nonprofits. If the opportunity is available for that space to spill out into the grounds for events, that's available there. Uh, otherwise, the intention would be that this is used by the tenant, which is Habitat for Humanity, as their boardroom space. But I think that's a, another opportunity we want to look at in terms of, you know, increasing more public open space that that could be because it extends out into the, the green space, the garden, and then that could be something that you can have some programming during the day, especially when it's raining or when it's cold. Um, so let's talk about that um, in terms of having more public access Understood. to part of that space. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. Councilmember Ku. Oh, before Councilmember Ku, I understand that we may have uh, two people that might want to be added to this panel. Your architect, uh, Mr. Jordan, and uh, David Vincent from SAGE. Would you like to come up and join this panel for questions? I think we would have them join if there's questions that they need to answer relative to the designs. Um, okay, yeah. thank you. We'll, we'll continue then. Councilmember Ku? Uh, hi. Um, can you explain uh, to the public uh, what is a month-to-month -month lease? Uh, how can you terminate a month-to-month -month lease? Um, uh, we have the, because it's not a long-term lease um, and it's month-to-month, it's -month, we have the ability at the um, end of any month to decide not to renew it for the next month we'd need to give a 30-day notice to say that we do not intend to renew the lease, um, at which time um, the, the tenant is required to uh, vacate the site and plan for vaca uh, vacating the site. So uh, you just need to give them 30-day notice? According to the current lease. Yeah, and they cannot stay and they say, oh, I want to three more months, six more months. You know, as we've been going through this process, we've been, um, you know, very, sen you know, in a, in a normal circumstance, for example, on a city-owned site where we've designated a developer, we'd already have given the developer some site access through a temporary license agreement to start doing environmental testing. We've been um, very sensitive, obviously, to the to the um, existing use, knowing that um, it's it's a benefit to the community um, right now. So we haven't required them to leave the site, but we've been very flexible um, to date. And uh, we would, you know, continue to be flexible um, going forward um, in, in terms of getting that site access. But at some point, um, assuming the project receives approval, we will need um, the tenant to leave the site so that we can do our um, environmental testing and due diligence in order to prepare for development. So uh, I noticed you have uh, 8,400 square feet uh, public space. Uh, who made the determination and what are the uses of this public space? Who decide, oh, this will be a garden, this will be a, uh, a playground, or whatever, you know? So we, HPD, put into the request for proposals a requirement that at least 5,000 square feet um, be, be um, used as publicly accessible open space. Part of the review process was looking at the approach that the development team was proposing to design and develop that site. Um, the development team has run a number of charrettes to have an inclusive process to inform that design. 
um, and I know they're going to continue to be inclusive as they make final decisions, and, and HPD will be part of that process as well, but as final decisions are made about what the open space will, will actually look like. Can, can you use the, at least part of the space for garden use? Like the residents can grow uh, vegetables or flowers, whatever they want to grow? Um, yes, that's certainly an option, and I know one that, that came up um, in the charrette. Um, I will also add that that's actually one of the benefits of having um, the development team manage the open space because um, most park department, um, most parks operated and managed by the parks department do not actually allow for community gardening um, unless they're um, specifically for that use through the Green Thumbs program, for example. So that is one of the benefits, too, of having the development team manage the site is that we can be flexible in determining the final uses of the open space. Because it's very really popular now. No, mm -hmm. A lot of buildings have the rooftop gardens or, or some kind of gardens for residents to grow their own vegetables or flowers. Uh, uh, my next question is, this, this building has no parking, right? Correct, there is no parking at the no, building. Not even one parking space? Correct, we have bike parking in the cellar. Uh, so how do you handle the commercial deliveries? Street front loading. Street front loading. Uh, so uh, this is really strange, you know, they have no parking at all? Hmm. No, nor do many of the spaces along Elizabeth Street have dedicated parking. All right, okay. So you will create a lot of traffic uh, uh, parking, and the, I mean, the traffic is going to be terrible once the building is done, yeah. Okay, uh, I, I finished my questions. Thank you very much, Councilmember Koo. Thank you, panel. We're going to call up the next panel at this time. Uh, I'll state for the record that we were joined by Council Member Mark Traeger as well. I'd like to call up Assembly Member Deborah Glick, Toby Bergman, Community Board 12, Toby Bergman, CB2, David Gruber, CB2, and Carter Booth, CB2. Just before I begin, um, I came from a rent regulation hearing across the way, and um, my colleague, Yulene Nu, uh, is on the housing committee, and that's why she is, uh, she is still there, and she will um, probably have staff uh, deliver some testimony later on. She's definitely stuck. <laughs> Come on up. Thank you, Assemblymember Glick. Welcome, by the way. Glad to have you. Thank you. All right, you may begin. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify before you today regarding the Elizabeth Street Garden Uniform Land Use Review uh, pro procedure application for the disposition of city-owned land at Elizabeth Street Garden Site in order to construct the proposed Haven Green development. And this is a difficult and complicated ULERP. The Haven Green development is a prime example of the need for the City Council and this administration to have a more transparent and understanding approach to the needs of a community. In this instance, the proposed destruction of the Elizabeth Street Garden despite affordable housing being a public benefit, uh, is emblematic of the constant pernicious way in which the city pits two scarce resources, like affordable housing and open space, against 
each other. It is disappointing to me. It is disappointing to me that residents are asked to choose between critically needed affordable housing and vital open public space. These two elements are essential for the quality of life in our increasingly dense city. This administration has spoken at length about affordable housing and affordable communities. However, the concept of livable communities is often lost in the equation in favor of pursuing other public policy goals where, uh, wherever feasible, even when more appropriate and robust opportunities exist elsewhere or have been offered by the community. This is what has happened here with Elizabeth Street Garden. Lower Manhattan, and particularly Community Board 2, has one of the lowest ratios of open space to population and is frequently forced to fight to maintain the little space they do have. Affordable housing is desperately needed in the city, and we all know that. While efforts to develop affordable apartments are important, sacrificing a beloved community space where there is an available alternative site that has not been fully explored is doing a disservice to the greater community. While there are basic land use questions surrounding this application, the merits of the ethical question that our city faces in this particular ULERP remain apparent. In the case of Elizabeth Street Garden, if the community uses a space as a park, it has all the characteristics of a park, and there is a grassroots-based effort to preserve it for the quality seen in similarly other open spaces, it is then effectively a park. As as part of the discussions over the last six years regarding the Elizabeth Street Garden, CB2 has suggested an alternative site at 388 Hudson Street in order to build a much larger development of affordable senior housing. This site was once promised to CB2 as an open space and is used as an access point to Water Tunnel 3. While it may be a little logistically difficult to ask Housing Preservation Development, the Department of Environmental Protection and the Department of Buildings and a private developer to actually work together to build on this location. That does not mean that we should rely on destroying Elizabeth Street Garden simply because it is easier. Unfortunately, and I will point out, there is a park across the street from this alternative site which could serve the um, residents as well. Unfortunately, this administration has indicated that they wish to build on both sites and not allow the community to maintain an already used open space as a park in addition to building a larger amount of affordable housing. I find this particular ULERP and the proposal that this administration is forcing the community to absorb um, and debate flies in the face of the stated goals of previous objectives undertaken by various agencies. In theory, the community board process should allow for local control and discussion about how city-owned sites, those assets that are owned wholly by the public, can be used in the future. My opposition to this development does not mean that I am opposed to affordable housing for seniors when it is constructed on sites that are valuable to the community, quite the contrary, nor does it indicate any animus towards Hav Haven Green and its partners. They simply responded to an RFP the city never should have released. As it happens, I'm simply forced to oppose communities being forced to decide how to dispose of their necessary public assets when presented with false choices surrounding communities. I will point out, I will point out in another uh, community not far away, a parking lot that was designated for affordable housing was subsequently turned into a park. This is a park. It has been used as a park and they are being forced to forego crucial, essential open space. Uh, it is a false choice. There is another better site. Thank you very much. And I urge the City Council Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses to deny this application. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Assemblymember. Appreciate you being here. Assemblymember New? Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the proposed plans for Elizabeth Street Garden. My name is Lawrence Hong, Chief of Staff for Assemblymember Yulin Niu, who serves as the Assemblymember for the 65th District, which is home to the Elizabeth Street Garden. 
I will be delivering the member's statement on her behalf. Following the demolition of a public school, the derelict lot was overrun with weeds and covered in debris. Our community poured countless hours into creating new open space. There was no direction from the city in developing the garden to what it is today. I wanted to make, uh, I wanted to make it very clear that Elizabeth Street Garden is what it is today because our community sta stepped up when the city would not. We engaged our community to develop the Elizabeth Street Garden into a jewel which meets our community's needs. As a member of the Committee on Housing, I recognize the need for low income and affordable housing in New York. There is an Assembly Committee on Housing hearing on rent law set to expire in June that the members presiding over as we speak. I have fought for critical funding in our housing system and affordability in our community. I have also stood with advocates and other elected officials to defend against privatization of public space on all fronts, such as NYCHA housing, public facilities like Rivington House, green spaces, and open space. I firmly believe public land should remain public and require ample public input prior to any change in usage. When public land becomes privatized, it rarely, if ever, returns to the public. Therefore, we must be doubly sure that the local community needs are taken into account fully prior to engaging that often permanent change in ownership. Lower Manhattan is in need of affordable housing, but we cannot pit the need for housing against the need for green space, especially when good alternatives are available. Both are vital and both are in dire need of protection and expansion. Our neighborhood is the only downtown neighborhood that New York City Parks defines as underserved by open space, with an open space ratio of 0.13 acre per 1,000 residents. In Little Italy and Soho, we have even less open space, with an open space ratio of 0.07 acre per 1,000 residents, or about three square feet per person. The city proclaimed its commitment to expanding open space to 2.5 acres per 1,000 residents. Yet the current plans for the garden lowers the open space ratio even further and eliminates nearly 70% of the open space currently available from 20,000 square feet to a mere 6,700 square feet. The EAAS environmental assessment statement arbitrarily stated that the eliminating the garden does not do any harm, even though it will reduce the extraordinary minuscule amount of public open space this area has. Losing the garden, or at least diminishing and altering the garden, should have triggered a more extensive environmental review process to fully capture the damages done through the, these plans. In addition, we believe the city owns this site and trusts for the Board of Education. The current plan to transfer the property for a non-educational purpose, such as creating non-permanent affordable housing and office or retail space, does not adhere to the requirements of the trust. Eliminating the garden for non-permanent affordable housing and 11,200 square feet of below market or office space is not a win-win scenario like the city often portrays it as. It is a false choice. As Community Board 2, elected officials like myself and others and other advocates have said time and time again, a win-win solution is to build up to five times as much affordable housing at a nearby city-owned 25,000 square foot alternative site at 388 Hudson Street and designate the Elizabeth Street Garden as a New York City park. Choosing this solution would not set a precedent. In fact, the mayor supported similar re real win-win solutions in Chelsea, where the city is creating a new park on West 20th and building more housing on the larger city-owned site nearby the park. We should be discussing a real win-win solution and creating plans for truly affordable, permanently affordable housing, while supporting the garden's operations in our community. In face of the overwhelming support from Community Board 2, other elected officials, and community residents, I urge the City Council to vote nay on this proposal and to seek out a solution that can match all of our community's needs. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Applause, community Board 2 members. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Carter Booth. I'm the chair of Community Board 2 Manhattan. CB2 has been working to preserve the entirety of Elizabeth Street Garden for many years. Thousands of people support Elizabeth Street Garden, and most of our elected officials have specifically identified and support saving and preserving Elizabeth Street Garden in its entirety. The proposal before you is masquerading under the guise of balance and fairness. For some reason, this has been caught up under um, this idea that this one space needs to serve multiple purposes. Right now, it serves its single purpose in the best way possible as a beautiful garden and open space that is used by an entire community from young to old, newcomers to old timers. The proposal, the proposal before you now has one. Sp the proposal before you now has one space serving multiple needs, resulting in a below-par project all around to address two major issues in our community: senior housing and public open space. It's hard to understand why we are here at this point right now when there is a better solution. We can do better for seniors and the community in this case. You will hear this again today. The solution is a balanced solution, balanced a balanced solution across the district lines which allows for preserving the gem which is the Elizabeth Street Garden in its entirety and creating a significant larger amount of senior housing on an alternative site on Hudson Street 
also owned by the city and which is located within CB2. Good governance and long-term planning for New York City should not include jamming multiple uses resulting in marginal, marginal plans, but it should include a larger vision that crosses district lines and allows for projects to shine. I urge the City Council to vote no on this proposal and send it back for more work so that we can all benefit from better alternatives for senior housing and preserving Elizabeth Street Garden in its entirety. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon. I am David Gruber, the past chair of CB2 and the current chair of the CB2 Elizabeth Street Garden Task Force. The community board has been trying to save Elizabeth Street Garden for over five years now. It's not a storage facility of, of old stone building parts or a park that's mostly for new millennials, uh, as some have said, but a vibrant park used by all residents of our community, teens, young families, seniors, from Chinatown, from Soho, from Tribeca, from the adjoining Section 8 housing. It's programmed all year long, and the summer movie nights, the Halloween harvest festivals, the free community barbecues are attended by thousands. And Elizabeth Street Garden is always listed as one of New York's 10 most beautiful and unique parks. I'm not saying it's an equivalent to Penn Station at all, but there will be buyer's regrets in a sense of what did we do and what were we thinking if this park is largely destroyed? We have over the years tried to engage and meet with our city council member to work out a win-win site swap, just like the mayor, and people have referred to it just earlier, just like the mayor and Speaker Johnson did in Chelsea. And what the mayor says is an example of win-win governance. We have identified a site that can in fact be built with far more FAR possibilities outside the landmark district, but within the boundaries of CB2, which would mean that the residents of CB2 who get 50% uh, uh, priority have a much better chance of landing a unit. We have offered other pathway ideas that could be pursued, but nothing has gained traction. It's not a NIMBY uh, community board. We have 178 units coming up on, 350, on 550 Hudson Street. And we, when we rezone Hudson Square, a huge swath, we made sure that there was an incentive for affordable housing. Some 6,000 people have identified themselves as friends of Elizabeth Street Garden, and almost 10,000 are on the mailing list. Wouldn't you, as city council people, um, uh, how would you react uh, and consider other possibilities if that many people spoke out in unison in your district? Our three public forums were attended by some 800 people. We know the city council almost always block votes behind the issue council person. But let this hearing not be just going through the motions of a pre-decided exercise, but a real hearing. I call on the city council not so much to vote no, but to vote to return the ESG, Elizabeth Street Garden issue, back to the council to work out, like the mayor and the speaker did in Chelsea, a good, go good governance solution. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Toby Bergman. Uh, I'm a member of uh, Community Board 2. I'm also a past chair of Community Board 2. Uh, I'd like uh, the, I think we all understand uh, the deference the council has to its local members for uh, largely local issues. Uh, but there's also a reason uh, why ULERP ends with the council. Uh, and that's because uh, sometimes there's a need for a larger view, particularly when there's a, an issue that's generated a lot of conflict in the community. So just one person really should not be making the decision, and it's a time to not show that deference. It's not a matter of not showing deference, it's a matter of being the council, a uh, council for all New Yorkers. Uh, I think if you look carefully at the Community Board 2's resolution, you'll see that we did oppose this project, but our last clause of our resolve tried to offer a roadmap for a solution here. Uh, we think we have a better site. We suggested that site. It's a bigger site. It's a better place. It serves Community Board 2 also. But 
We also think much better job could have been done on this site, and we think that with a very small reduction of the amount of housing units, uh, this site can provide a much, much better park. Not a perfect park, maybe, but a much better park. That can be done by adding two more floors, altering the, the slid to provide two more floors in this building. I think something the community would embrace given the importance of the two competing issues. Uh, also, l greatly reducing the amount of office space, which was never part of the balance. It was supposed to be a balance of parks and housing, not of parks, housing, and offices. And no matter how good the cause of those offices, there's still offices that could be put someplace else. Then there are aspects of the design of the building, like the big pass-through, which looks attractive in the beginning, but and covered open space is never really an attractive kind of, it's more like a driveway than, than anything else. It more serves the retail uses than anything else. And then finally, there's kind of a protrusion out of the back of the building, which really just houses a conference room. Now, Community Board 2 holds dozens of meetings a month, and we find conference rooms. There are plenty of conference rooms, plenty of places to meet in our neighborhood. A one-story conference room building that sticks out of the back of the, uh, the, this building should not be taking away space for open space. And it doesn't just take away the space that it covers because it divides the open space, the potential open space, into what's being offered, which is very small, very narrow, and very odd-shaped. And by removing that conference room, you would also cr open up the adjoining space and create a much, much bigger space for a reasonable uh, open space park. The last thing I'd like to say, I think we really like you to take seriously what we raised about the importance of parks department management. That doesn't mean it has to be done by parks department employees. We have a great example uh, at opposite the old St. Vincent Hospital where a park was built and that park is managed by the building association of that, uh, of that project but it's managed under the guidelines and auspices of the Parks Department through a contract with the Parks Department. It makes all the difference. That makes it a public park. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much for being here today, all of you. Uh, we really do appreciate your testimony. And um, for myself, uh, past chairperson of Community Board 12, uh, the second largest community board in the borough of Queens. Uh, I especially uh, want to thank our Community Board 2 counterparts for being here today. It's, it's very, very important that we have a balance of discussion, and uh, I really do appreciate you bringing that balance here today uh, to this forum. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are going to bring up our next panel. In the interest of time, we are going to have to start a clock of two minutes, or we will be here until midnight. And uh, I know we don't want to do that. So we will call upon Lynn Kelly, Nancy Sanchez, Kay Webster, Valerie Reyes Jimenez, and Marvis. Do check. Anybody can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Kelly, and I'm the executive director of New Yorkers for Parks. New Yorkers for Parks is the city's independent research-based advocacy organization for over 100 years championing parks and open space for New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. 
We believe that healthy neighborhoods require a balance of essential city services, affordable housing, schools, healthy food, and of course, open space. While our organization seeks to maximize publicly accessible space wherever possible, we also recognize that in a well-functioning city that strives to be equitable to all its residents, it's necessary to plan for the present and future needs of New Yorkers. It is a false narrative for New Yorkers to have to choose between open space and new opportunities for deeply affordable housing. However, we ultimately believe that the city is within its rights to move forward with developing Haven Green. Uh, and furthermore, we support the city's attempt to balance the dire need for affordable city housing in this area while still providing open space for the community. As the public's voice and grassroots organization for over 100 years for open space, we have not come to this decision lightly. It was made after many meetings and conversations with stakeholders, parks and garden advocates, both groups for Elizabeth Street Garden, Department of Housing Preservation Development, the Haven Green Development Team, and our own board of directors. We do have some concerns with the current Euler proposal that we hope the council take into consideration. Number one, long-term maintenance. The Parks Department is overburdened, full stop. We urge the city to have the developer commit to a long-term agreement. Public access. To maximize access, we urge the city to have hours beyond 9 to 5 p.m. so residents and community members can actually use the park after hours. Public input. We urge the city to continue its tradition of public input opportunities, particularly as it relates to design and programming. Make no mistake, we understand the frustration of the community members who have come to cherish this garden, but we also understand the difficult choices that has to be made by the city in light of the dwindling opportunities to create deeply affordable housing in high income neighborhoods like Little Italy. Thank you for considering our testimony. We support this application. Thank you. Thank you. Please, you may proceed. Thank you. My name is Nancy Sanchez, and I live in one of the edifices in Brooklyn. I came to Riceboro in 2012, at the time when I could not pay my rent anterior with my mother. It was a moment of suffering when we saw on the street. My mother had Alzheimer's, and I was sick with chronic conditions. The housing available for older people is of vital importance. We have adequate access to the adequate rent to our income, the services that offer with the support so that our days of maturity are pleasant, nos hacen sentir apreciados y podemos vivir con dignidad. He tenido apoyo de nuestras trabajadoras social, el manager del edificio, y lo que ha hecho la gran diferencia en mi vida son mis clases de yoga, donde restauro mi armonía interior y los ejercicios han mejorado mi movilidad y balance. La clase de Zumba es alegría, música, te inyecta ganas de vivir, Mi salud ha mejorado considerablemente. Mi clase de pintura me hizo descubrir la artista dentro de mí. Es la conexión con mis emociones, aprendizaje, pues tenemos un maestro extraordinario del que he aprendido mucho. Gracias por el bien que han traído a mi vida. Gracias a las personas que luchan por nuestros derechos en una edad donde la adultez es subestimada. Y aprovecho para dar apoyo a la construcción de Haven Green, que defiende a nuestras comunidades para acceder a viviendas justas y equitativas para las personas vulnerables y en desventajas. Gracias. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. We are going to have someone translate your testimony just so everyone can understand your message today. Good afternoon. I'll be reading the statement that Nancy Sanchez just presented in English. I arrived at Riseboro in 2012 in the moment when I was no longer able to pay rent for rent with my mother. There were moments of suffering and we saw each other living in the streets. My mother had Alzheimer's and I was sick with chronic illness. Senior affordable housing is vital. 
It allows for seniors to have low-cost accessible rent and on-site services that offer support and allows for seniors to age in a way that makes the seniors feel appreciated and dignified. I receive support from the service coordinator and property manager. What has made a big difference in my life are the classes, the yoga classes. They restored my inner harmony. The exercises have improved my mobility and balance. The Zumba classes bring happiness, music, and it fuels my will to live. It has greatly improved my overall health. The painting classes have allowed me to discover my artistic abilities, build a connection with my innermost feelings, and it has furthered my learning. I have an extraordinary teacher. Thank you for all the good that Riseboro has brought into my life. Thank you to the people who fight for our rights at an age where adulthood is underestimated. I'd like to take this opportunity to support the construction of Haven Green. Projects like this help defend our aging communities and allows for access to just and equitable housing for disadvantaged and vulnerable aging people. Um, yeah, good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mariusz Dujets. I'm a uh, custodian at the Empire Stable and, and I have been a member of 32 BJ for over uh, six years now. Uh, my union repre uh, represents over 80,000 building service workers across the New York City. Uh, we maintain and clean buildings like the one being discussed today. I am here on uh, behalf of my union to express our support for this project. As we all know, New York City is facing a serious affordable housing crisis, especially in Manhattan. At 32BJ, we support using our increasingly scarce public land to build projects like, the, like this one uh, that allow poor and working people stay in our neighborhoods and thrive. We are glad to see a development that will give low-income seniors the opportunity to be part of what it, it is uh, what is an expensive community. We are also happy to report that the development team for the project, project has made a commitment to provide good wages and benefits for the building service workers who will maintain the building once it is built. Rice Borough, a member of the development team who will handle the day-to-day -day management of the project, is a responsible actor uh, and 32 BJ can attest to this uh, throughout their portfolio. We are proud to support their efforts to design a project that delivers so many benefits and their track record of pairing affordable housing and good jobs across the city. Their example is one for all others to follow. We know this project will allow members of this community to live and work with dig dignity and mobility. We urge you to support it. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Valerie Reyes Jimenez, and I'm a community organizer for New York City with Housing Works. Um, I've been a housing advocate for over 25 years. Uh, my testimony is longer than the two minutes, and I would like to submit them in full to this body, and I will just read a portion in the interest of time. Um, I'm a native New Yorker with roots firmly planted in Manhattan. I was born in New York City, as were my children and grandchild. I worked for many years at the Housing Works offices just three blocks away from the Haven Green proposed site, and many of my colleagues still work there. I went to junior high school and high school in Council District 1, and my son learned to sail in the shadows of the Twin Tide. When, uh, when we're young, it's almost next to impossible to imagine oneself as an elderly person. We can think of it in terms of uh, sitting in a rocking chair, growing old with a life partner and reminiscing of our youth. Our grandparents are old. Not so with, the generation, uh, with this generation of grandparents and seniors. I would know I'm a grandmother of a 16-year-old granddaughter. Um, there are many injustices to people who are poor or black or brown, but the greatest injustice in this society is how the rich get richer and the poor get pushed out of neighborhoods that have been called home for generations. One third of all New Yorkers spend over one half of their income on housing, making it hard to achieve financial stability. Anyone who has lived in New York City all their lives should be able to live in any neighborhood they want and not be beholden to their race, family composition, 
sexual or orientation, age, or income. The question should not be why build here, it should be why not build here. In my experience, some of the most hurtful biases and discrimination I have ever encountered came from people who I considered neighbors and fellows, people who I believe fear that life as they know it, life in their safe, comfortable cocoons are in jeopardy and will change drastically. People who have said things like, no, this is not going to get built here. No, not in my backyard. I don't want these people here. A public display of discrimination and shaming that goes by the name of NIMBY, not in my backyard. In my mind's eye, having 123 real affordable housing units for seniors versus a community garden really is no contest. You don't have to be a senior or even a homeless person to appreciate the true human value Wrap in up, that. please. Hi, my name is Kay Webster. Uh, thank you for this chance to testify. Uh, I'm the president of the Sarah Roosevelt Park Community Coalition in a park uh, two blocks away from this site. Uh, I help uh, stewards, uh, steward park spaces to become community gardens, and I am a community gardener there. I help spearhead the fight for Rivington House, but I am speaking here primarily as a resident of Little Italy. Um, I moved to Bowery and Prince in 1990. When our son arrived in 1999, we sought places that welcomed children. Um, we joined a new parent cooperative housed in Community Board 2's Thompson Street Park House, and when my son went to PS 130, we played daily in the DeSalvio Playground. And to our delight, we found Green Thumbs Mathinda Kalunga Community Garden in Sarah Roosevelt Park. We did not lack for community gardens, Liz Christie, Mathinda, New Forsyth, and others and uh, diverse and vibrant outdoor spaces two blocks away. So I specifically want to challenge that notion. What changed in this neighborhood is the influx of many wealthier people. Um, we've endured the losses of neighbors, elders and others, and small businesses. A number of seniors and walk-ups were forced out with high rents or are trapped in walk-ups due to disability. One died of complications from a fire in her fourth floor walk-up very recently. High rents forced out most of the small businesses here that served our practical needs. The bodegas, the boot repair, the coffee shop, the grocery store, all owned or operated by people of color. This is a punishing city to grow old in if you're poor. Racism, sexism, uh, gay oppression, and disability make it even more brutal. Um, and we always need more green spaces. We always want more. Um, but I have to say, I don't think these issues are equivalent at all. This is a compromise. It will not be the statuary of the garden luxury marketplace that was open to the public in 2013, only after affordable housing was proposed here. Because I've lived here a long time, and I know that. Um, I, yeah, I know you wish my time was up, babe. <laughs> um, I will just say this. This is no charitable offer. This is about a chance for an affluent neighborhood to get right in these times. Our city is in deep trouble due to a lack of affordable housing, racism, sexism, gay oppression, and poverty. We don't get to say build this elsewhere. We don't get to pretend we've done our due diligence. We are not going to get out of our current mess, wealth disparity, without some sacrifices. And I don't want to walk down my street, look at people who are struggling, Thank you. and not have done anything Thank to make a much. difference where I live. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We'll call up the next panel, Joseph Reaver, Kate Kobayashi, Susan Wittenberg, pardon me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, I'm going by the writing, Mr. Winters, I think it's Brian or Brian Winters, Michelle Campo. Please step up, quickly. Are they here? Oh, they're upstairs.
Is Mr. Winters here? No? Then we'll call Leif Weatherberg. Oh, if it's you? I'm, oops, sorry, I'll start again. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Wittenberg, and I'm a longtime Soho resident, a documentary filmmaker, and a board member on CB2. I'm on the Parks Committee and the Zoning Committee, but I speak as a community member. I'm testifying in opposition to the Haven Green development that will destroy our beloved Elizabeth Street Garden. I'd like to correct a critical misconception. The city is not building housing on every available city-owned site. Here are several nearby examples. The city is not building housing in Union Square. It's building a tech center, office space. The city did not build housing at 19 East Houston Street. It sold the site for private office space. In the East Village, the city allowed a de Blasio campaign fundraiser and a New York City EDC board member to demolish a to demolish five walk-up tenements with hundreds of units of affordable housing, with hundreds of units of affordable housing for the 285-room Moxie Hotel. On the Lower East Side, the city lifted the Rivington House deed restriction and allowed a private sale, ignoring the mayor's staff recommendation to use the site for affordable housing. And in 2015, the New York City EDC issued an RFP to develop 137 Center Street to provide funding for Downtown Community Television Center, Inc., a, no a local nonprofit media arts center, not for affordable housing. And I say this as a filmmaker, that I thought this was a, a terrible choice. This RFP still remains outstanding, and the site, is, the site also remains another viable alternative for affordable housing. I urge you to vote no on the proposed development and pursue a win-win alternative. Build up to five times as much senior housing at an alternative city-owned site and save Elizabeth Street Garden forever. Thank you. My name is Joseph Reaver. I'm the executive director of Elizabeth Street Garden. Thank you so much for hearing us today. Uh, I want to start off by saying it's not a vacant lot, and I'm saying that to Margaret Chin over there. Um, it's a community garden, and it's a park, and it's a center for our neighborhood, and it's an outdoor museum. Elizabeth Street Garden is all of these things and more, and it's all managed and contributed to by the people of our community. This isn't a matter of open space, not just a matter of open space. It's a matter of protecting and preserving an iconic and heavily used place. If we're really working to achieve low-income housing, then we should achieve five times the amount of, at the alternative 388 Hudson site or any of the other sites that have been listed here, which Susan also mentioned. The build on both and everything we can mentality doesn't make sense, especially while luxury towers and the, like the Extel Tower are going up and remaining empty. Any process, any form of governance that leads to this sort of orchestrated division is clearly not in the best interest of the people. If a community such as ours can garner thousands of supporters of all different ages and backgrounds, show up time and time again over the course of six years, and still be unjustly discredited, wrongly labeled, and ignored, then how is anyone to believe that our city agencies and these processes are actually working for the people of this city and not the interests of developers or pay-to-play politics? After all these years of outcry, Councilmember Margaret Chin still has not visited the garden. Perhaps this is the only way she is able to refer to the space as vacant land. The city planning report states the proposed development will improve vacant, underutilized, city-owned site that lacks consistent public access. The HPD environmental assessment does everything it can do to avoid addressing the value of the Elizabeth Street Garden, and so do the developers. Many of the people making these decisions on this matter have never come to the garden. It's one thing to read about the garden, but it's another thing to entirely experience the garden in person. And before you make this decision on this matter, I urge you, and because it will affect thousands of people, I urge you and I formally ask you as individuals to come to the garden, visit the garden, and meet the community. 
meet them face to face and learn why we are all here today and what we're working so hard to protect. So I urge you to vote no against this development. I urge the subcommittee to take Please a hard up. look at the stakes and everything that is at stake here with Elizabeth Street Garden, Thank because you. there's no other place like it in Thank New York. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next panelist, please. Please proceed. Go ahead. Hi. Is this on? No. Oh. Hi. Michelle Campo, a member of uh, Bowery Block Association, Bowery Alliance of Neighbors, and Neighborhoods United. Uh, I want to just add to what I've written by saying that I've heard the deed restrictions in perpetuity mentioned several times with this building, and as we know, in New York City, that's an elusive concept. I am a native New Yorker and 40-year resident on Bowery near Spring Street, a mere two blocks from Elizabeth Street Garden. I have, I have been witness to many changes in my little Italy neighborhood over the years, both positive and negative. I remember the empty lot behind 21 Spring Street on Elizabeth Street. For years, the city, the city disregarded this city-owned rubble-strewn lot. Of course, the area was not desirable then. Then, several decades ago, a man rented this lot, cleaned it up, planted trees and bushes and flowers, did a lot of hard work. True, this was done for a commercial venture of architectural artifacts and not open to the public very often, but it was an improvement for the neighborhood. When an undisclosed deed was made in CB3 concerning the Essex Crossing development, this land in CB2 was offered up without any notification or discussion to Community Board 2. Now the garden, this beautiful interactive garden open to and enjoyed by the community is facing destruction. I suppose we all made it too enticing. This is not an elitist space. It is a truly democratic delight for all. I'm a dedicated housing advocate. I have been a supporter of Habitat for Humanity for many years. I work on housing issues with local residents. Yet there is something about this development which feels not quite right, including the fact that there is another location not far away with zoning which would afford for a larger structure and thus more apartments and more space for residents. Is the sticking point the fact that it is in another council district? Green space is sorely needed in this neighborhood for good health, clean air, education of children, serenity of persons of all ages, among many other factors. I know of no elderly neighborhood resident living in a walk-up who would give up this garden for one of its apartments, one of their apartments. Please, Please do up. not destroy the, our lovely garden. Thank you so much. My name is Kate Kobayashi. I've lived on Elizabeth Street for 42 years. And like Michelle, I have seen the many changes uh, in our neighborhood. Some, some welcome, some not. I also have been an advocate for affordable housing and rent control. Um, however, I find this project disingenuous for a group of people who so sorely need places to live that they would, uh, and have options to have a larger space. Who do the developers and people in government who supposedly represent this community think they are fooling? Affordable housing is invoke, invoked to promote a, a quick okay, but it is, the terming of affordable housing and perpetuity um, is a mockery to this, to this particular site. That said, Elizabeth Street, Street Garden is an oasis, not only because it's a, of its physical beauty, but it is also the essence of what community should be, where conversations by young and old from all walks of life exchange histories and futures an oasis, not just for the neighborhood, but thousands of tourists who, as well, um, desperately try to find bits and pieces of real New York, which still survive in the midst of shop the shopping mall that much of New the city has become. The garden and this neighborhood embodies the spirit of new and old New York. Within a three block area of the garden, one third of the storefronts are continually empty. These spaces are not viable except for tax write-offs. 
but not for a functioning community. This proposed development would only add to the glut. This kind of greed is not sustainable, but the garden is an oasis that does sustain life. Do not let it uh, be destroyed. Thank you so much for your testimony today, panel. You may be excused. We're going to call the next panel at this time. Thank you. Okay, we're going to call up uh, Tito Delgado, Stephanie Sosa, Lisa Janowski. I'd like to acknowledge that we have been joined by Council Member Barron and Council Member Miller. And um, I am a former site tenant of the urban renewal area. Um, my family and 2,000 families were, 2,000 families were pushed out of that site on the Lower East Side. And for 50 years, we fought to try to get back. For 50 years, we had empty lots there. Um, there was tremendous opposition to any kind of low income or affordable housing there. And very powerful forces, elected officials, fought against any affordability. Ability. Why do I bring that up? The reason I say this is that I'm very familiar what NIMBY looks like. I've been fighting it all my life. And this is not right. You know, you talk about uh, a garden like if it was a home. It's not. You know, I, I love parks. I spend time in parks. I don't want to sleep in a park, though. And, and, and this is your choice. I mean, I think there's a real compromise here. We can have both. But I don't want to, well, I do understand why there's so much opposition. And unfortunately, it's not very pretty. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Adams and members of the Landmarks Public Siting and Maritime Uses Subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Stephanie Sosa, and I am the Senior Associate for Housing Development Policy at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, also known as ANHD. ANHD's mission is to advance equitable, flourishing neighborhoods for all New Yorkers as a coalition of 100 community-based affordable housing and equitable economic development organizations in New York City. We work at the intersection of organizing, policy, advocacy, and capacity building. Our extensive network has built over 100,000 units, 120,000 units of affordable housing. ANHD supports the development of Haven Green mission-driven led 123 unit affordable housing project for low-income seniors. I also want to note that Riseboro is a member of ANHD and it is their mission to maintain affordability to all of their developments. It is also their mission to adhere and believe in ANHD's missions and commitment to affordable housing. The reality is that over 20% of New York City's senior population is in poverty. New Yorkers are, are over the age New Yorkers over the age of 60 are 55% more likely to be severely rent burdened than residents between the ages of 30 and 50 years of age. The senior population is projected to increase by 40% through 2040 in New York City. The housing crisis will continue to impact larger percentage of populations if the supply of senior housing does not match the demand. 
I also want to mention that even if affordable housing was developed on other public sites, it would not meet the needs of New Yorkers when it comes to affordable housing. It is essential that the city do everything in its power to increase access to affordable housing and alleviate the rent burden on senior citizens. We need you to wrap up. Community Board 2 has not developed much affordable housing in comparison to other New York City neighborhoods, locking low-income residents out of the neighborhood. Haven Green will allow for low-income seniors to call Little Illity their home, thus lowering their risk of facing severe rent burden or even homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, if there's anyone in the balcony, we will encourage you to please come down into chambers on the first floor. Join us. If anyone is in the balcony, please come down at the first floor chambers and join us here. Thank you. Uh, we're now joined by Sage and uh, the architect partner. You may proceed. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Grayson Jordan. I am an architect with Paul Castrucci Architects and the Lower East Side. My firm worked with Haven Green team to create a participatory design process for the open space of this project. And I'm here to describe that process as well as express my strong support for the project. Uh, participatory design seeks to engage all stakeholders in the design process. This approach encourages input from voices beyond the client and the design team, inviting end users, neighbors, and other stakeholders to imagine and shape the future of the site. Beginning in the winter of 2018, our team initiated an, an outreach process to identify and engage local and citywide stakeholders. The team engaged in a broad public outreach campaign, inviting nearly 900 local and citywide organizations to participate, participate in designing the open space of Haven Green. The outreach included email, neighborhood flyer campaigns, and word of mouth. In a series of four public meetings, we provided a range of activities to, sol to solicit input. We collected a a statistical baseline using a design survey which was available both online and at public meetings. We used preference boards to understand what types of plants, seating, design features, and activities were preferred for the site. We asked participants to share personal stories about the existing space or another meaningful outdoor space. Finally, we engaged in design charrettes where participants were able to share specific and concrete design ideas. Through this process, our participants, participants provided meaningful insight, spirited engagement, and hundreds of unique ideas. Our team carefully recorded, organized, and analyzed the public input, creating a participatory design report that outlines the data collected, and that's the report that you have in your hands, uh, including ideas and thoughts that recurred throughout the process, providing a guiding vision and inspiration for the design of the Haven Green public space. Haven Green seeks a difficult but essential balance, providing urgently needed affordable housing and publicly accessible open space. On the Haven Green project, I have worked with a dedicated team that is committed to achieving both of these goals on this site. I hope that the council will share my support for this project. Thank you. I just have a quick question for you. I'm glad that you brought the uh, material. You spoke about participation. Can you give us a rough estimate of how many participants were involved in this process? Yeah, so the, in the meetings themselves, across the four meetings, there was maybe 120 participants, um, and I think uh, roughly 150 uh, survey uh, participants. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is David Vincent. I'm the chief program officer with SAGE. SAGE was founded in 1978. And, and is the country's first and largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT older people. LGBT older New Yorkers need and deserve affordable welcoming housing. That's why SAGE is excited to be involved in the Haven Green Project as one of the on-site social service providers. At this development, SAGE will be providing case management services to LGBT elders who reside in the building and offer program to LGBT older people and other community members who live in the neighborhood. Service enriched LGBT friendly housing is crucial for our city's LGBT elders. Aging alone can be wrought with challenges, including social isolation and diminished income. For LGBT older people, however, many of whom who have experienced discrimination throughout their lives as a direct result of their sexual orientation or gender identity, the deck is stacked against them. This uneven playing field has long-lasting effects on their financial security. More than four out of 10 LGBT Americans over the age of 65 cite financial problems as a major concern. 
of LGBT older people report that they are, are extremely concerned about not having enough money to live on compared to 36% of straight couples. Further, 30% are concerned about housing stability. LGBT people face profound challenges in accessing, in accessing welcoming housing. A 2014 10-state investigation conducted by the Equal Rights Center and SAGE found that 48% of same-sex older couples testers seeking housing in senior living facilities across the country experience discrimination. The data from these, this study combined with anecdotal reports by SAGE's constituents in New York City shows, shows that pervasive challenges continue. LGBT-friendly housing is crucial to enable our elders to age in their communities, to avoid isolation, and re receive culturally competent care. That is why SAGE supports the development of affordable LGBT-affirming uh, elder housing <coughs> at Haven Green. Thank you. Thank you. Were there questions? No? No questions? Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony today. You. We do appreciate it. All right, we'd like to call up Jean Wilkie, Robert Pierpont, I think that's the way, Pierpont, Pierpont, uh, Ben Shepard, Ruth Fluvog, and Past Patrick Cristiano. Are they here? We just we need forms for you. Were the other three? Okay, let's just. Lisa Fairstein. Christy Avron. Dylan Goodrich. Louis, Louis Semper, Semper Tegui. Chris, Kristen Shea. Allison Skye. Still looking for our fifth panelist. Krista Grauer. Hamilton Reagan. Carrie T H O R Ryan Keenan <laughs> Hannah and Gabriel Byrne. Catalan Balog. Lisa Keenan. Adina Schwartz. Sean Sweeney. Renee Green, I feel like I'm taking attendance in <laughs> ninth grade. <laughs> Renee's, here. Renee's here. Did he sign in? Do we have a form? What's your name? Come on up. Essie's Dacon. No problem.
you may begin. Thank you. I'm Janine Kiley, president of Friends of Elizabeth Street Garden. I'm a park and education advocate. I spent all day yesterday here at the public hearing on school diversity, but today I speak in opposition to the Haven Green development. We are here because our grassroots initiative uncovered a secret backroom deal. Meanwhile, the city ignores a win-win solution. The effort to save the garden started from a grassroots initiative by local activists to get more public park space. It was only then that we uncovered a secret backroom deal that our council member negotiated as part of a rezoning in another community, a non-binding behind the scenes deal with zero public review, zero public discussion and zero transparency. The, the site has not been promised for housing for decades. That is simply false. Since then, the community has held seven hearings, passed five resolutions and supported an alternative site where up to five times as much housing can be built. But the city ignored our our community and a win-win compromise. The council member calls her, has called for greater transparency against other backroom deals on Rivington House, the Two Bridges Mega Towers, the Chinatown Jail, and many other projects. But there was no transparency on this deal. I've shared a detailed presentation. You have the slides. You can access it at bit.ly forward slash save ESG. The garden site is held in trust for educational purposes since 1822. The city actually committed to a new school and housing, and the promised affordable housing was built in 1981. The development will destroy the garden and leave behind a tiny open space. And most important, affordable housing is allocated by age, income, and household size, not sexual preference. But with 50% preference for CB2 residents, the win-win will benefit five times as many of Councilmember Chin's constituents. Support transparency and a win-win solution. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. So um, you know what I have here in my hand um, is a rubber stamp. And we've been told, oh, don't bother with the city council. They just use the rubber stamp. They'll never vote against the council person out of deference. So I, I show this rubber stamp as a symbol of what is wrong with this process and how else to explain how we got here today. When a giveaway of public land that has been held since the 1800s is sold to a developer for a dollar, decided during a secret backroom deal with Sheldon Silver without so much as a courtesy call to our community board. I call it a rubber stamp. After the residents held hearing after hearing where hundreds of people turned out to show their support for the garden, rubber stamp. When literally thousands of letters have been written in support of this stunning outdoor community center that many call the soul of our neighborhood, rubber stamp. The borough president came to our Harvest Festival, saw people coming together and declared that this space should never be destroyed, but then out comes the rubber stamp. So our grassroots coalition went further. We realized how deep this housing crisis was and we pleaded with our electeds to help us find an alternative so that green space and housing would not be pitted together uh, against each other, tearing our community apart. And they did. The leaders of our community board found a piece of land that could house up to five times as many seniors and they passed a resolution to allow that swap. And what do we get? A rubber stamp. Did our council member even bother to visit Elizabeth Street Garden to see why this community has never given up? Did they, she sit down with us to work on a solution, forge coalitions and find a win-win compromise, actually do the hard work of a leader and harness the energy that is in that room? She could save this garden and in return demand that we unite our efforts towards making more housing, but no, she did not. She is simply relying on this rubber stamp, but I have faith I have faith that you know better, that you will put an end to this cynical process that robs people of their voice. Please vote against the destruction of our precious green space and put away this dreaded rubber stamp. And in doing so, you will have a community who is ready to get to work. Put away the rubber stamp because we are ready to participate. Woo! Thank you, Ms. Hellstrom. You may proceed. Hi, my name is Lisa Fairstein Mata. I am a member of the community, and I am here adding my voice in opposition to the proposal known as Haven Green, which will destroy Elizabeth Street Garden, the only open green space in our densely urban neighborhood, without providing anywhere near enough truly affordable, supportive housing for New York's neediest senior citizens. I thank the committee for considering the implications of this misguided and deceptive plan. I want to draw your attention to two issues that are most troubling. First, 
Despite the rhetoric of the real estate companies and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, the Haven Green proposal will not help the most vulnerable elderly New Yorkers. As council members will know from experiences with HPD's so-called affordable housing in East New York and elsewhere, what HPD counts as affordable housing is not actually affordable in the real world. According to their own prospectus and Comptroller Stringer's 2017 Aging with Dignity report, only 32 of the small studio apartments at Haven Green will be affordable to a New York City senior citizen who is reliant on Social Security and disability payments, which average $1,500 a month. To put this in context, these 32 affordable studios occupy about as much of Haven Green as do the proposed offices for Habitat for Humanity. Even more worrying is the fact that HPD is supporting the, this destructive Haven Green plan while at the same time, the neighborhood's largest and most successful, genuinely affordable housing project, the adjacent Section 8 apartment at Lyra right next door, is being allowed to slip away into the private market. Because of HPD's inattention, these 150 spacious two-bedroom apartments will be lost in the next few years. Other testimony will have told you about alternative sites for affordable housing. The alternative site at the existing Lyra complex could be preserved and adapted to provide more than 300 senior-friendly studio apartments 10 times the housing promised by Haven Green, while preserving and protecting Elizabeth Street Garden in its entirety. I share the concerns of the thousands of New Yorkers who support Elizabeth Street Garden. I urge you to reject this Haven Green proposal, tell HPD to do its job, and preserve truly affordable, supportive housing for our neediest citizens, and save Elizabeth Street Garden as a public civic space for New Yorkers of all incomes and ages, from the elderly to the very soon to be born. Thank you. I'm Kathleen Borg, and I'm also a longtime community member, and I've prepared remarks. It's here, two pages, but I decided that I'm just going to make a very short point here, is that, um, that I think that the purpose of this meeting is to engage in a rational debate over, um, over this plan, and I haven't seen that there has been a real rational debate here. So the, the, the only point of contention, as far as I can see here, is why not pursue a, a solution that makes possible both the housing and, and the garden. So what's put forward here that is that in the context of city planning, it's not rational to, to formulate the choices between destroying the garden or having uh, affordable housing. But none of the supporters of the development in any way engaged this point. There hasn't been any argument for why not, uh, you know, why not pursuing that, that plan. And of course, you know, there, there are arguments for, for affordable housing. Nobody here, none of the participants of, of this meeting want to, you know, we don't need to have any further arguments. We are all, you know, very aware that there is a housing crisis and we are all very aware of the value of that. But the point that we are discussing here is not that, whether we are aware of the housing crisis. The point we are discussing here, why not pursue a solution that makes both possible? And just reiterating how housing is important is not a response to this point. So that was all that I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, my name is Aziz Dekan. I'm a city resident and uh, the executive director of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. Uh, we represent, we advocate for the over 600 community gardens in New York City. Um, I'm going to be 67 next week, so I guess I qualify as a senior. Um, many of the membership of the New York City Community Garden Coalition are of people who can and will want affordable housing. So let's not make this a, a different, let's not make this the argument about who wants affordable housing more. Everybody needs affordable housing if you're gonna live in New York City. You know, what worries me is that this, co this committee and this council is going to follow in the footsteps of Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani created the false dichotomy of open space versus affordable housing. That false dichotomy, that false language continues today. Lots, not just this one, but lots throughout the city get sold for a dollar to developers who claim affordable housing units. If the city really was interested in affordable housing, they would take Hudson Yards and make that affordable housing. 
if only, the city was only, really only two minutes on the clock, folks. You're taking up his time. If the city was really interested in affordable housing, they would look at the current units that are available to HPD and turn those into affordable housing. So let's not make this the false dichotomy of Rudy Giuliani. Does anybody here want to follow Rudy Giuliani? I don't. So here's what I propose is that we stop talking about this particular lot and start talking about all the open space in New York City. Talk about what racial, environmental, and social justice looks like. And it looks like everybody in this room. It looks like the council. And it looks like we need to join together and make this city a better city, a resilient city, and a sustainable city. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sure everyone in this room wishes you a very, very happy birthday. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Okay, we're going to call up the next panelist. Again, I feel like I'm the high school teacher reading the Delaney cards, so we're going to go for it. Valerio Orselli. Ah. Celestine Jones. John Scott, Christopher Good, and Didi Derrico or Derrico. Andrea Cianfrani. There is room for Jim Forat if you're here, Jim Forat. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the City Council, members of the public here. My name is Valerio Orselli. I am speaking as a founding member of the Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association and Cooper Square Community Land Trust, a nonprofit cooperative project on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And I'm also a former resident of Little Whitley when it still was Little Whitley and affordable. And I'm here to support Habitat for Humanities and their partners in the Haven Green Project. Without a doubt, you will hear today impassioned speeches in support of the garden on Elizabeth Street, detailing the lack of green space in the neighborhood. While communities surely need green space, the development of affordable housing for seniors must take precedence. In the project I was involved with, uh, Francis Golden Apartments on Delancey Street, over 93,000 seniors applied for 100 apartments. Cooper Square provided affordable housing for many people. The housing is so affordable, nobody moves out, and we're developing into a naturally occurring retirement community. They have new apartments, our seniors, but our apartments are walk-ups, and therefore they're practically prisoners of their apartment because they can't go up and down five or six flights of stairs. We need elevators, like in a new building. What is a lack of open space in Little Italy, there are a number of other green spaces nearby. Liz Christie Garden on Houston Street, Washington Square Park, two blocks away, they have available to them 300,000 square feet of open space to Sarah Roosevelt Park on Christie Street. CB2 should advocate with the New York City Parks Department to set aside 20,000 square feet within the park to relocate the sculptures on loan from the gallery owner next door and replicate Elizabeth Street Garden. Since 2014, only 93 new affordable housing units have been developed in all of CB2. The area is 72% white. 
the medium home value is $2 million. If this trend continues unabated, Little Italy will truly become an upper middle class white ghetto. For these reasons, I urge you to vote in support of the ULR item for Haven Green. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is John Scott, and I've been fighting for affordable housing for 40 years. Um, I'm a past president of the Independence Plaza Tenants Association. I'm currently uh, the chair of the senior committee on the Tenant Association. Um, I have had the pleasure to work with the seniors since I have retired. And one of the things that we have to do, and as leaders, as yourselves, is that we have to recognize that our seniors have given a lot to our society. And what we are doing is we are forgetting them. And we understand about um, gardens. I was a fighter for the Washington Market Park. I was one of the original people that was on that board. But what we have now is seniors need housing. And we know that this is a space that can be used, and they need these kind of services. I happen to know somebody that I'm working with in the senior center that lived in Little Italy. She raised kids there, but what happened is now she is a senior, she cannot stay in a walk-up, so she had to leave and go into a family that couldn't really accept it, but had to because she couldn't walk those stairs. She lived in that community. She was pushed out of that community. This will bring her back into the community. I have been lucky. I have raised two daughters in affordable housing in Mitchell-Lama. But what happened with Mitchell-Lama? They are pushing out our people because it expired. And so I was lucky. And if I was not in this affordable housing, I couldn't live here. But I have been a person that made a lot of difference in my community. I've been a leader. I have built this community with other people. And what I ask is, yes, gardens are important, but our seniors are much more important. Please, do the leadership thing. Vote for senior housing. Thank you. My name is Didi Dorico. I am a senior and I'm disabled. I'm a client with, uh, well, the uh, visiting neighbors who helped me a great deal where I met Christopher Good here who really lives up to his name because if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be able to go to my MRIs and I do have a tumor at the end of my spine. That's why I'm sitting here and he helps me a great deal. But I feel sorry for a lot of my friends who can't get out and can't go up and down stairs. I'm lucky I have an elevator apartment. I love flowers, I paint them, I'm an artist. But I love people more. And if I have to distinguish between a garden and where a person has to be a prisoner in their own home, and it has, this goes beyond color, creed, or anything, because we're all human beings, and you never know in life how you're going to turn out to be, because I never thought of this happening to me. So we have to really look as we age as what is happening there, and take care of and respect our fellow human beings, and I hope there are more people around in this earth like my dear friend here, Christopher, who gives his time and energy just to take me to a doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Andrea Cianfrani from Live On New York. We represent 100 nonprofits that provide community-based services to older adults throughout the city. We support this, we strongly support this application for Haven Green. Live On believes that a fair city, in a fair city for all ages. And that is because having a future and contributing to the resilience of our communities does not have an age cutoff. And let us be clear, we are all aging, and this is about all of us and how we age as a city. Aging brings momentum, but it always also brings challenges. 
We commissioned a study in, several years ago finding 200,000 seniors on wait lists for affordable housing, and equally as disturbing as that is the average time is seven to 10 years, and we know that that is going up. Also, many seniors are rent burdened, paying over half their income in rent, making difficult choices every day on what to spend their fixed incomes on. Number one question that many legislators get in their offices, senior centers, staff get, and we get in community-based organizations is how to find affordable housing, whether that be today or in the future for themselves or for their loved ones. That is why we commend the administration for making senior housing a priority in the housing plan, and we commend Councilmember Chin and her leadership, as well as City Council, for really looking closely at the issues of affordable housing when making very important community decisions. We support this project and the Haven Green team because they're comprised of mission-driven organizations, and they know that housing is more than bricks and mortar. They know that these uh, housing are more, and it's more than just a building. These are community-focused organizations that are building services and supports for the entire community. This project and many of the affordable senior housing projects built by nonprofits and community-focused organizations as part of development teams follow this model and look at this through this lens, and it's something that we, we really support as making New York a better place to age. I'd like to close with this. Um, live on New York has been working for the past year on a um, study of affordable senior housing buildings, and we've talked to seniors who live there, many of them for decades and some that are in new buildings. We ask them a lot of questions about the great things about living there, but the one question that disturbs us and kind of keeps us up at night is the question of where would you be if you did not have this home? They all have the same answer, and that is, I don't know. And that is really troubling, and it's something that we can, we can look at and start addressing with projects like Haven Green, and we hope that this will provide that answer to 123 new homes for individuals in New York. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I've had the good fortune uh, to have both lived and worked in the neighborhood since 1977. Um, being a longtime resident does not give me special privileges, but it rather obligates me to share with newly arriving and certainly with the less fortunate. We are now one of the wealthiest communities in this country. We can work together and we can do better. I've designed and installed green roofs and gardens throughout our city. The New York Times recently reprinted an Oliver Sacks essay that beautifully illustrates the importance of a garden. My love for gardens, however, is not inconsistent with my support for Haven Green. Those that oppose this housing say that it should just be built somewhere else. The reality is that there are many more possible locations for gardens than there are for housing. Unlike housing, a garden can be adapted to many different spaces. Just as a derelict rail line was transformed into the High Line, Elizabeth Street itself, not the current garden, but the street itself, could have a beautiful garden laid over it. This is not at all far-fetched. Similar to the High Line, a garden can be created in shallow soil and without breaking the pavement. Political will is more difficult. But just this week, Scott Stringer put forward a proposal he calls pavement to playgrounds. Why not pavements to gardens, starting with Elizabeth Street? Our borough president supports Haven Green, but she wants it to include 30% more open space. Instead, we should be asking that Haven Green provide 30% more apartments. An extra floor or two would have zero downside, yet provide more homes. Many of the people I assist are essentially trapped on the upper floors of old walk-up buildings. Nobody wants me to carry them down the stairs. I do, but they don't want it. Let's not think small. Let's not pit gardens against housing. Let's take back our streets for better use than storing and moving cars. Let's build housing on every available lot. Most importantly, let's consider those in need before we serve ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jim Forat. I am 78 years old. Could you quiet down, please? Could you stop the clock until that? Could you stop the clock, please? Please continue, Mr. Forat. Uh, thank you. My name is Jim Fora. I'm 78 years old. I live at 227 Waverly Place in a six-floor walk-up. 
I came to the village in 1961. I moved into my current ap apartment in April of 1969. I am scree protected, which will tell you about my income. I have been a cultural worker and a community organizer all my life. I have dedicated most of my political work to providing a safe space for LGBT people. We are in a dangerous particular political moment now that poor people and LGBT people of all the diversity my community represents are at, at, under siege by an administration which is uh, cruel. I don't want to think that my neighbors in CB2 are also cruel. I look at you, those of you who have been attending the garden versus the seniors housing meetings that we've been having through Community Board 2, et cetera, and I don't want to have a fight with you on that level, but I have to tell you, particularly the city council person who represents me, who happens to be the speaker of the city council, stop playing politics. Forget the checkbooks of those rich people that live there and the, and the middle class people that support them. If I lose my eviction case of three years, I will be homeless. There is no place that I can live in my community. And I want to say to Toby B. Bergman, who's testified earlier, who said that all the seniors care about is an elevator. No. I also want to live in a community that I have lived in for over 70 years now. I want to, I want to be able to talk to my neighbors who are still alive and to the young people that are here. And I think that all of you should really go home and think very hard about why, on either side, why we are fighting with each other when we're talking about human lives. Thank you very much. I thank you all for being here today. Thank you for your time. Next, we'll call Norman Siegel, Reverend D. Donna Shaper, Shaper. Okay. Are you, have you signed in? What's your name? Siggy Ray. What's your last name? Rabel. Siggy Rabel. Okay, you can come on up. Yes. Kirsten Theod Theodos. Thank you. Charles Birnbaum. Okay. Then we'll call Kate Fletcher. Melanie Macchio. Mr. Siegel, you may begin. This subcommittee should not, not approve the Haven Green project. The city has failed to comply with its obligations under CEQA. The EAS is inadequate, and the negative declaration issued by HBD is unfounded, inappropriate, and procedurally defective. Pursuant to CEQA, HBD must review the EAS and take a hard look at and thoroughly analyze relevant areas of environmental concern. If the destruction and development of the garden may include include the potential, potential for at least one, one significant adverse environment impact, then by law, an EIS must be prepared. And simply, it was not done here. Manhattan CB2, who has testified, is the government body closest to the issues in this matter. Since 2013, they have consistently expressed support for the permanent preservation of the garden. You heard them speak here this morning, talking this afternoon about the quality of life, health, and well-being. 
We need to listen to Community Board too. If HBD and the city ignore and disregard the sage advice of Community Board two today, it sets a horrible precedent tomorrow. The city and agencies like HPD can ignore and disregard a community board in your district. Let's not allow that to happen. Community boards should count. The Louis Street Garden, and as people have said before, is not a vacant land as HPD has characterized it. I think they intentionally and by design demeaned the garden and its status by calling it a vacant lot. To the contrary, it is sui generis. It's unique. It's well used, beautifully landscaped, publicly available open space. Furthermore, as Joe Reaver said, you should go to the garden. When you go to the garden, you see something different than abstract, especially since right now, if my eyes are correct, the only member on the subcommittee is the chair. One out of five are here now. Is this what democracy is about? Absolutely no. You've got to go to the garden before you vote. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kirsten Theodos, and I strongly oppose the Haven Green project. Everyone in the city agrees that New York City is in an affordable housing crisis. And while we desperately need to create new affordable apartments for New Yorkers, I ask this question, at the expense of what? The Elizabeth Street Garden is only one example of Mayor de Blasio's Build Baby Build administration stealing public assets to be handed over to private developers. In fact, it's already happened to our libraries, kids' playgrounds, and parkland in the Bronx. Should we demolish all of our gardens, libraries, playgrounds, and parkland into oblivion for the sake of, air quotes, affordable housing? The truth is, the city refuses to effectively manage the low-income housing it already has, thus establishing the premise that the private sector is the only way to create affordable housing. Another truth is, the de Blasio administration is completely controlled by the Real Estate Board of New York, also known as Rebney. Today, the Daily News reported that de Blasio's deputy mayors, commissioners, and high-ranking aides had at least 358 meetings and talks with both commercial and in-house lobbyists in just 11 months. In-house lobbyists who got meetings with top city officials include the president of Rebney, John Banks himself. It's also recently been reported that the de Blasio administration opted to buy 17 buildings for the notorious slumlords, Podolsky brothers, to be converted into affordable housing. And the lawyer who re-represented them in the portfolio sale is Frank Carone, a longtime de Blasio ally and fundraiser. In the case of the Haven Green Project, the developer has teamed up with Riseboro. According to Riseboro's website, one of the board members is Frank Carone. So this is just yet another one of de Blasio's many pay-to-play scandals involving city-owned land to be given away to private developers. If the city greenlights this project, it will be one of the most egregious developer giveaways since Rivington House. So I urge city council to shut it down. Hi, my name is Siggy Rabel. I live in Greenwich Village. Uh, the Reverend Donna Schapper had a leave. She's the senior minister of Judson Memorial Church, and she is opposed to the development. Um, this is my statement, not hers. I have lived in my present apartment for close to 40 years. I am opposed to the, the development of this project for two reasons. I heartily support affordable apartment development for both seniors and homeless seniors but I do not support this proposed development. Over the last two or three years, I have attended many of the community board forums and meetings uh, regarding the development. I object to this development because there is a vacant city-owned parcel located at 388 Hudson Street, which would provide far more than the 123 tiny single-room occupancy senior living units proposed by Habitat for Humanity and the developers. The community was presented with this plan developed by the three men in the room, which is Habitat for Humanity, the city's representatives, and the developer as a done deal. The pitch to the community was that it could develop or design the small portion of the garden that the developers carved out. I have been told that the public will only have access to the privately owned space from nine to five. As part of the deal, Habitat uh, will be afforded 11,000 square feet at below market rent because it is considered a community use organization, when in reality it will be used by Habitat as office space. The Hudson Street parcel was never discussed. 
Once the plan was presented, community residents and store owners, as well as Community Board 2 and many elected officials joined together to oppose the development and have remained opposed to this development. Even so, the proponents wish to go forward with the plan, notwithstanding the community's objections. This is not what democracy looks like. Thank you. Thank you. According to experts consulted by Elizabeth Street Garden, there are problems with several aspects of the EAS. First, the EAS indicates a more than 2% decrease in the open space ratio as a result of the proposed project. According to the secret technical manual, whereas here an area is extremely lacking in open space, such a decrease indicates that the project may have a significant adverse effect on the environment. Therefore, an environmental impact statement should have been prepared. Second, and perhaps because the EAS fails to acknowledge the value of Elizabeth Street Garden to the community, it does not adequately address the inability of the proposed open space to meet the broad needs of the community, as does Elizabeth Street Garden. Among other concerns, the proposed open space will be in shadow in the morning and at least part of the afternoon for much of the year. Under the secret technical manual, a neighborhood character assessment should have been performed. The destruction of Elizabeth Street Garden may adversely affect neighborhood character in that the garden is a key attraction to the neighborhood and serves a unique and critical role in the community. The proposed project will destroy an open green space with a number of trees. Such spaces can have a cooling effect and are a valuable resource in efforts to mitigate climate change. A hard look would have assessed the proposed project in relation to the city's commitment under Executive Order 26 to supporting the goals of the Paris Agreement. The City Council should deny the proposed project. A full environmental impact statement should have been prepared. This would have been clear had there been a hard look at the relevant areas of environmental concern. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Melanie Macho. I am an architectural historian here in New York City. I have also worked in Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. And I am here today to talk about the potential historic significance of the Elizabeth Street Garden. While there's been much mention about it as a green space in a neighborhood starving for that, as much of New York City is, there's an additional exceptionalism in the landscape, and that is an expression of an outsider artist. An outsider artist is one that is producing work outside of the mainstream art world, sometimes without training. Alan Reaver created Elizabeth Street Garden as an artistic expression of his vision for the Little Italy lot. He laid out the garden design in 1991, adding lawn spaces, pathways, and horticultural features, including the t still extant anchoring pear trees. Reaver added statuary and architectural elements in response to the site's layouts and with regards to their own spatial relationships. According to the Cultural Landscape Foundation, Reaver's curated collection of garden statuary includes columns and gazebos designed by Frederick Law Olmsted's firm for a Long Island estate that has now since been demolished, as well as a stone and granite balustrade designed by French landscape architect Jacques Rebert. He's most well known for plotting and planning much of downtown Philadelphia's historic district today. The balustrade was removed from a 36-acre Linwood Hall estate, um, which sat just outside of Philadelphia and was one of the largest estates in that area. The reason why I bring this up is to call out Reaver's collection and curation of this art by noted architects and placing these pieces in inspired expression is an, a vision of the designer. He is in both inspired by this work and inspiring others by this placement. He has also contrasted this with contemporary pieces as well. His curation of the landscape came from his own expression rather than inner formal training, which makes it potentially significant on a national and regional historic basis. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your time today. We really appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Okay, Jordan Press, Tom Connor, 
C.K. Tang, I think. Ben Carlos Taipin. And Michael Madrid. Ted Glass. It is off, thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair. My name is Jordan Press. I've been before the Land Use Committee in various capacities before, but today I'm here without anyone asking me to be. I'm here as a New Yorker, a Manhattanite, a Yimbyist, and an affordable housing advocate. I'm also here as a strong believer in the central tenement of our National Fair Housing Act, known as Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, or AFFH. AFFH states that it is not good enough for governments to simply take enforcement action against those who discriminate against people's housing due to their race, religion, age, and other reasons. Rather, it says we, that in order to break historic patterns of inequality, that governments must affirmatively work to integrate neighborhoods and provide housing choice across the city. It would be a ter terrible failure of our land use policy if we were only building affordable housing in neighborhoods with high poverty and high minority populations. This project is a great step in furtherance of AFFH. In my judgment, you only need to speak to one elderly person who has spent their entire life working and taking care of others who now faces housing instability to know that your vote in favor of this project lands you on the right side of history. While I respect everyone's position, I lament how contentious this has become. Today should be a day where we congratulate the architect and the development team for putting together an outstanding proposal that balances the need of, of outdoor space with housing. We should be extolling the brave and courageous stance of Councilmember Chin and her staff for having such moral clarity on this issue. We should be thanking City Hall and HPD for having the guts and vision to not back down even when it was not always popular. As to the other so-called alternative lot that has been discussed on the opposite end of this community district, we should develop affordable housing there too, and for the same reasons that I laid out above. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is uh, Tom Connor. I'm 88 years old. I've been desperate about this housing situation, and it's getting worse. I want to thank Margaret Chin for her leadership. She is outstanding. She has been extremely helpful to senior citizens in many different ways. But the housing issue is crucial. I am also a member of Community Board too, although I am not speaking for them as I am in a minority, but I don't want you to get the wrong impression. The people that spoke from Community Board 2, they were the majority, but there were others that don't agree with them. I'm one of them. Now, it seems to me that the people that are fighting against the public senior housing, these strike me as people that feel entitled they want what they want. They talked about getting 8,000 letters in. How do you think they did that? They hired a professional staff. They've hired an expensive lawyer. They've hired all kind of public relations. How are the homeless going to compete with these rich people? They're trying to gentrify that area. There's no social justice if people have to sleep on the street and that other people can loll in a garden and enjoy themselves, which is nice if they can do it, but not at the expense of putting people on the street. I have lived a long time, and I recall when I was a teenager, people would be evicted, 
And what would happen, a city marshal would come to the apartment building, and the city marshal would empty all of the property and throw it on the street, whether it was raining or not raining, and their property was ruined. Just imagine a 90-year-old person losing their apartment with all their memories, all of the things that they enjoy in life. Thank you. I think that it is a horror story that we're hearing from the people that are fighting this project. I don't trust them, Thank and you I don't testimony. trust their motives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sake Tang. I've been a resident in the Little Italy neighborhood for over 27 years. I recognize most of the people in the other camp, and I have been an advocate for quality of life for our community as well. But that's just it. Who are the people in our community? At the very beginning of this debate, Mary Schifolo, an 80-year-old woman, came to me, an Italian woman, and said, I want senior housing. I want to live in a building with elevators. So actually talking to her changed my mind. My very own neighbor, who was a 94-year-old gay veteran, was confined to his apartment. He couldn't walk downstairs. If there were senior housings with elevator, he could have gone downstairs in the wheelchair and enjoy a little bit of sunshine. Not to mention the increasing aging Chinese, Italian, Latinx population who came to this area and built a community before it was trendy. They lay the foundation for what is so appealing for the new residents today. So when we talk about quality of life for our community, I think about them. They are also a part of our community, and they need senior housing now. They also deserve an opportunity to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. You're not on the, please proceed. You're not on the wrong panel. Uh, OK. My name is Jordy Mark, and I'm here as a 47-year resident of the South Village, now known as Soho. Um, and I um, was also the tenant leader in my building, which was HPD owned, which was sold to a developer for a dollar. And it took us years to fight to protect our homes, our rights, and the affordability of our apartments. And we didn't get the elevator. I am here. I am also your demographic, Margaret Chin. I am your demographic. I am a low-income senior. I am a gay New Yorker, and yet I am opposed to this project of the Haven Not-So-Green Project, and I am in support of the Elizabeth Street Garden. The property that will be destroyed is a well-loved community asset and it's wrapped, and this project is wrapped in so many catchphrases and words and hooks as possible for the purpose of clouding the lack of vision and the failure of the city to adequately provide housing for all New Yorkers. We have heard about the vulnerability of the elderly and the homeless over and over again today, but the Elizabeth Street Garden is not pushing seniors out of their apartments. In fact, many frequent visitors are seniors. We hear about homeless people, but the Elizabeth Street Park is not making people homeless. It is a respite for all. This project is a, is a perfect example of how the city creates unnecessary conflicts between legitimate needs that could easily coexist. This is an artificial choice between housing and open space. Is there a need for housing that will be affordable? Of course. Is there a need for senior housing and housing for the homeless? Yes, without question. And should housing be LGBTQ friendly? Yes, but that by law should be all buildings. We don't need a designated building. So I ask you to not destroy this garden and instead take a look at the reality that we have a boom in buildings in this city. We have more apartments for the wealthy. Every, every day more apartments go up, and yet none are reserved as affordable housing. Thank you. That's the problem. Thank Fix you very that, much. and you'll have housing for Thank everybody. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Carlos Typen, and I'm here representing Open New York, an all-volunteer activist group which advocates for more housing of all types, particularly in high-opportunity neighborhoods. It's appalling that this 100% affordable project geared towards seniors at risk of homelessness in one of the city's richest neighborhoods is controversial at all. 
particularly given that there's a seven acre park, public park two blocks away from this private event space masquerading as a public community garden that I just heard one of the garden supporters refer to as a garbage park. You know what I think is garbage? That the garden supporters have chosen to spend countless hours and hundreds of thousands of dollars on lawyers and lobbyists instead of using those resources and their time to improve Sarah D. Roosevelt Park, which is suffering from decades of disinvestment, mostly because the people who use it are less privileged than the supporters of Elizabeth Street Garden. That is garbage. The garden supporters accused this project of dividing the community. It didn't have to be this way, but given their selfish behavior, this claim of division may be the only thing that they're right about. This project pits members of the community who have empathy for our seniors and our less, less fortunate neighbors against those who don't. While I'm sure many of the garden supporters sincerely believe in their hearts that they supportable, support affordable housing and seniors, their actions say otherwise, as they repeatedly express the depressingly familiar refrain of, I support affordable housing, just not in my backyard. So I ask this committee to approve this project in short order for all the reasons that others have cited. Once it's been approved, the only thing that will stand in the way of seniors occupying these homes will be the shameful lawsuits that have been filed against it. Aside from the crucial housing that will be constructed, the only silver lining to this shameful process has been the fact that the opposition is wasting so much of their time and money. I just hope that we don't lose any seniors who can't afford to wait until the opposition is done with their tantrum. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, what what is your name? Sorry. Ted Glass. Okay. You Thank called you. me last. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, I'm in support of this uh, development. Uh, I've lived on Sarah D. Roosevelt Park on Forsyth Street for 35, 40 years. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of the changes. Um, mostly a Dominican neighborhood when I moved in there. Uh, I've seen the kids grow up and I've seen the, their parents age. Um, I think there's, this argument is somehow out of proportion. I, I just don't understand why a garden is more important than somewhere for a low-income person to live. I just don't get it. And this alternative on Hudson Street is, who knows, how long would that take? This already, the Elizabeth Street Garden fighting this has probably delayed this development for a considerable number of months, if not years. So I, I, I just build them both. It's just, it's a, it's a false choice. Build them both. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Michael Green, is it Mike? Is it Green? Um, Friends of Elizabeth Street Garden. Michael Green or Gruel? Is that it? Thank you. David Eisenbach. I think we had Aziz Dekan already. We had so. Nina Taylor. Richard Emerson. Elliot Messe. Myself. Arthur Darris. Lawrence Hung. John Campo. Liz York. Okay, you may begin. Hey, 
Am I on? Yes. What a big difference. Uh, my name is Michael Gruen. I'm the attorney for Friends of Elizabeth Street Garden. And wearing another hat, I'm president of the City Club of New York and a very staunch advocate of parks and open space. Uh, the, the subject uh, of this project uh, obviously concerns two very worthy social goals, housing for low-income persons and providing essential open space for all. I agree with people who have gone before and say it, that one, one should not have to make a choice between those two. One should not have to suggest that we, we tear down uh, a Central Park or that we use uh, the Metropolitan Museum for housing. Uh, all of these have to be done, uh, th th both, both uh, types of development. Um, the problem here is that the council is being asked to make a decision on the basis of a woeful lack of essential information. Worse than that, much of the information it has is appallingly misleading. And they, uh, well, put it differently, the uh, ULERP and SECRA have been developed in order to provide vehicles for uh, enlightenment of the legislative process uh, for, uh, in the case of SECRA, uh, for the uh, council uh, and others to be able to consider right from the beginning of the development process what the impacts on the um, environment are going to be as a result of the project. Now, unfortunately, uh, how this has devolved is that the, uh, the, the uh, uh, available information or the available tools are being used by uh, advocates in order to confuse the issues and support a result rather than to consider what the uh, environmental impacts really are. Uh, I hope that you'll uh, read the full copy of my text, uh, which I've made available to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my name is Richard Emerson. Okay, that's better. Richard Emerson. Uh, I've been frequenting Nolita, or the area before it's called that, since 84, uh, primarily back then for CBGBs, uh, now long gone. Uh, and I'm a property owner in Nolita as well. Uh, my background, I'm now uh, an academic. I write on corporate ethics, corruption, uh, and also on urban planning, uh, a fellow at Stanford Law School. The, um, and I've been following this with interest because I've been uh, involved as a trustee or with the trustees of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And this really is, uh, as everybody says, a false dichotomy. The garden is quite special. I object to what's happening. Um, and I do so both from the process as well as the financial situation. Um, I'm, I was blessed. I ended up being an early executive at the Blackstone Group when I got founded. We're one of the largest uh, private equity funds in real estate. And I was also a senior vice president at Microsoft. I ran corporate development strategy and was on the executive committee. But I've watched with dismay actions like this with uh, Margaret Chin, for example, over 135 Bowery, where promises were made to the community and a very important 1817 building was torn down, um, which uh, the National Trust actually wanted to protect as well over the auspices of affordable uh, office space. Of course, the building, none of those were ever implemented. The building was flipped within a year. It wasn't landmarked. A large profit was made. Um, I've tried to meet with Margaret several times over the last five years and have not been able to. Um, I'm dismayed that she probably has the largest percentage of donations from real estate of any of the councilmen, 12.5%. Um, and there's two types of corruption. There's the overt corruption, like uh, her patron silver, and then there's the more corrosive ones where real estate sort of goes in. Um, I could go through a lot of these documents and find loopholes. Money finds a way to beat these. In 10 years, um, this, this won't even make a dent in terms of affordable housing. In fact, probably won't even exist in that format anymore. 
Uh, so I just, um, I'm here just because I believe in process and ethics and I'm really dismayed by what I've seen. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elliot Mizell. I'm a partner in the firm Brill and Mizell. I'm here representing Alan Reaver, who is the creator and uh, developer of the uh, Elizabeth Street Gardens through an entity, Elizabeth Street Inc., and is also the owner of the adjacent historic firehouse. Um, one of the advantages of going late is that a lot of the things that uh, I think you should hear, you've already heard. There have been some very eloquent speeches. Unfortunately, many of them have been quite generic and have been anecdotal. Uh, one of the things about real estate that is generally known is that it's not generic. Real estate sites are specific, and that's why there are zoning boards of appeals, and that's why there are variances and special permits, because it's not generic. This housing project has been generically talked about as providing senior housing. Senior housing in the abstract, and we've heard many very uh, uh, heart-wrenching speeches about people who are lacking housing. Uh, but there, there are flaws in this project that are very serious, including some that have been mentioned already about the community space. A substantial portion of this project is really just offices. They call it a community facility, but it's offices for Habitat for Humanity. Mr. Reaver, who has the firehouse adjacent to the garden, is willing to dedicate a substantial portion of the ground floor of that building as indoor community space to complement the use of the garden if the garden is preserved. Speaking of generics, the garden itself was misleadingly described as a vacant lot. That's part of the obfuscation of what's going on here. A backroom deal was made because inadequate low-income housing, affordable housing was provided in the two million square foot Spora development in an adjacent community board, and therefore this site was traded off, but it was concealed. It was called 21 Spring Street. It's not 21 Spring Street, which is already the Lyra affordable housing. So it wasn't even mentioned that the garden would be destroyed. Furthermore, this garden has been described by the community, by the um, uh, the uh, Cultural Landscape Facility uh, uh, Foundation and by Melanie uh, Macchio, who spoke very eloquently here before, as outsider art, as something that's really quite unique. In tribute to that uniqueness, and in order to protect it, we are in the process of filing a VARA claim under the federal copyright statute to protect this as outsider art in the tradition of the five points uh, in order to preserve a unique historic and cultural asset that the uh, EAS did not even address in any way. Hello, my name is Arthur Darris. I'm just a classical guitar teacher. Um, and I teach that because I think we reach deeper parts of our humanity through, through beauty. And that's why I'm here. Happy May, everyone. For those that don't know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. I begin with this because the issue of green space is really one of public mental health. There have been numerous studies that correlate a causating factor of nature exposure and mental wellness. A 2015 study published by Stanford University states this, urbanization is associated with increased levels of mental illness, but it's not clear why. Through a controlled experiment, we investigated whether nature experience would influence the frequency of rumination. What is rumination? Rumination is repetitive thought focused on neg negative aspects of the self, a known risk factor for mental illness. Participants who went on a 90-minute walk through a natural environment reported lower levels of rumination and showed reduced neural activity in an area of the brain linked to risk for mental illness compared to those who walked through an urban environment. Now, I'm aware Mayor de Blasio is in favor of removing Elizabeth Street Garden from the Nolita neighborhood. I'm also aware that his daughter, Kiara, struggled with drug addiction to cope with anxiety and depression. I'm aware de Blasio's wife responded to this by uh, creating Thrive NYC, which is a so-called initiative for mental health care in New York City. The initiative, according to the website, focuses on public awareness and early treatment of mental illness. To all those who are in favor of development, 
ESG is early treatment of mental illness. It is unreasonable to lower the quality of life to raise quantity of life. Let ESG remain, please vote no. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elizabeth York. I'm a constituent of Margaret Trins. Also, I'm a Sierra Club member. Save Our Seaport, Children First, NYPIRG, and 350.org. The housing crisis has no age limit. I've had to move as a New York City resident 18 times because of increasing rent. My living situation is tenuous, but all of our lives are tenuous. Our community is earth. Every one of us benefits from trees. This development is an environmental disaster. This short-sighted plan gives a few temporary apartments to a few elderly at the expense of future generations, while developers profit throughout the whole destruction. Build where there's no trees. When green space is gone, we all lose. Our planet is in a crisis. We don't have time for new trees to grow unless we reduce carbon emissions in just eight years, all of the coral reefs will die from a 2% centigrade rise in the Earth's temperature. Think about it. It's happening now. Think about future generations. Save our green spaces and put buildings on concrete. Unless we drastically change our collective home, our planet Earth will never recover. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thanks very much. So I'm going to call the next panel, um, Steve Herrick, Bobby Sackman, Allison I'm not sure, Cedar maybe? Laven Thomas, Lauren Thomas, I'm sorry. Maria Scabio. Rodney Washington. Eric Diaz. John Shabel, Ken A, Mark Greenberg, We can take it, or if you want to read it on his behalf, that's fine. And Saif Lashaw. Whoever's ready, you may begin. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Steve Herrick, Executive Director of the Cooper Square Committee. I'm testifying to express our strong support for the ULERP for the Haven Green Senior Affordable Housing Project on Elizabeth Street. The project partners have created a site plan that balances the dual purpose of developing 123 uh, housing unit units for seniors, including homeless seniors, while preserving some 6,700 square feet of publicly accessible open space. They've designed an inclusive project that will set aside up to 30% of the units to LGBT seniors who have very few gay-friendly senior housing options and will receive supportive services from SAGE. The building will be environmentally green. They've invited the community to participate in a series of design charrettes to determine how the open space will be used. The Cooper Square Committee has a track record of sponsoring uh, 600 low, uh, uh, development of 600 low-income housing units and we also have supported open space at numerous sites. 
However, while the loss of 13,000 square feet of open space uh, in the Little Italy, 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 Little Italy community is regrettable. Sarah Roosevelt Park is two blocks east of this site. It's nearly eight acres, and the Sarah Roosevelt Park Coalition offers community gardening opportunities to local residents. No one is denying that Community Board 2 and Little Italy are underserved by open space, but the lack of affordable housing is a much more severe crisis. Some opportunities to create more open space exist uh, in and near Little Italy, particularly on a 12,000 square foot site owned by uh, DEP at 142 Grand Street, six blocks from this site. Meanwhile, opportunities to create a substantial amount of senior housing are non-existent. There's simply no other city-owned properties in Little Italy that can accommodate uh, this type of housing. The garden advocates keep propose, proposing locating senior housing at a different site at 388 Hudson Street in a totally different neighborhood above the water tunnels. They claim it can hold some 500 housing units or more, which is not true. Zoning allows for at most 200 units at that site, and engineers have not determined whether it is even possible to build there at all given the uh, uh, underground infrastructure. Of course, if you can, we support that, but it's an additional site, not an alternative one. Um, it's unfortunate two neighborhood needs are in direct conflict, but Cooper Square Committee supports the development of senior housing at this site. Thank you. My name is Mark Greenberg. I'm the executive director of the Interfaith Assembly on Homelessness and Housing, and I'm here to offer testimony in support of the Haven Green Project. And I want to commend Habitat for Humanity and Councilmember Chin and Riseboro Community Partners for their great work in bringing this to us. Uh, since its founding in 1985, the Interfaith Assembly has advocated for public policies that address New York City's crisis of homelessness and the shortage of affordable housing. And for over two decades, we've been pleased to count Habitat for Humanity as a strong ally in our efforts, which collectively have helped to create and preserve many tens of thousands of homes for some of our most vulnerable New Yorkers. When we first learned about the Haven Green Project, we were understandably sensitive to the loss of Elizabeth Street Garden. Green spaces are crucial to healthy communities. However, after further consideration, we've come to the conclusion that the creation of 123 truly affordable units of permanently, permanently affordable senior housing, including 37 for people who've been homeless, plus the inclusion of over 8,000 square feet of publicly accessible garden and green space, flexible community activity space, and on-site community services make this project a significant net gain for its neighborhood and our city. With, with over 63,000 men, women, and children sleeping in New York City shelters, including over 5,000 seniors, New York City cannot afford to pass up any opportunity to develop affordable housing for our people in need. Additionally, the inclusion of publicly accessible green open space in a project that utilizes state-of-the-art energy-efficient design can provide a prototype that all city-based housing projects should look to replicate. The loss of a community garden is regrettable, and the frustration of the neighbors who've celebrated community in the Elizabeth Street Garden is understandable. It's our hope that the community members who built and celebrated community in the garden will welcome their new neighbors with open arms and continue to invest their energy into a neighborhood that will now include new homes for 123 seniors who will be afforded the blessed opportunity to live out their twilight years in safety and security. Thank you. Thank you. My name is John Schabel. Um, I've lived in this neighborhood for 40 years, which makes me a relative newcomer. Um, it was talked before about the, the history of the space on Elizabeth Street and that it was a public school. I know someone in the neighborhood who went to that school and would love to live in this project. And let's also remember that this neighborhood was a neighborhood built for immigrants. I've known several seniors in the neighborhood who spent the last years of their lives without leaving their apartments because they couldn't handle the stairs, which is kind of a unique problem uh, to this city in terms of the rest of the country because it's, New York is the densest city in the United States. It's very disturbing to see these two public needs pitted against each other. And, but the outcome is I don't think things can remain <clears throat> the way they are. It's been suggested here in previous testimony that the park can move into the street. 
That's the kind of thinking that this city needs to go forward. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eric Diaz. I'm in favor of the Haven Green Project. I am the executive director of Vision Urbana Inc., a community-founded nonprofit organization providing programs and services for seniors, which include a NORC senior program that offers holistic services to seniors living vertically and horizontally on Delancey Street, as well as a weekly food pantry service that offers food security for hundreds of seniors every week on Essex Street. I have been joined today with seniors from our NORC program who are passionately supportive of the Haven Green development. I represent a community and population that needs opportunities. Opportunities to age in New York City in brand new affordable housing. Because, sorry to say, their current housing within NYCHA and walk-ups are no longer acceptable living conditions for seniors. I represent a population that deserves their latter years to be better than their former. And that is why I'm here fighting for that opportunity along with uh, this panel and many others. I personally look forward to holding accountable and working with the CBO Habitat for Humanity, responsible for providing services to residents with cultural sensitivity in multiple languages, such as Spanish, Cantonese, and Mandarin. Once more, I'm in favor of Haven Green, and my name is Eric Diaz, on behalf of Vision Urbana and our NORC program. I have the testimony of Rodney Washington. Should I read it really quickly? We'll, we'll take it, put it on the record, thank you. Hi, my name is Saif Lashaw, and I'm a CBG resident. Um, the, by the city's own census projections, the senior population from 2010 to 2040 is going to increase by 40%. That's 400,000 additional seniors living in New York City. Um, so as other people have stated, and I want to echo, it's not about alternative sites, it's about additional sites. Um, and, and as a former uh, homeless LGBTQ youth who now has a rent-stabilized apartment, I truly understand how important it is that we provide as much affordable housing as possible in the city, and I implore all of my now neighbors to look beyond their experience and look beyond privilege and understand what a dire need housing is to so many people in the city. Because if, if you've experienced that, I, I don't really understand how we can sit here and be discussing um, having a full garden as opposed to a reduced size garden when we're talking about housing 123 people. Um, and also in, in terms of there not being any accessible green space, Sarah Roosevelt Park is over half a mile long and it is two blocks away. Um, so it, I just, I don't, I don't want to take up time because I know we've all been here a long time, um, but I, I very, very strongly support the Haven Green Project and I encourage all of my neighbors to, to take the perspective of other people that live in the city and extend a welcome, uh, extend a welcome to our new neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. We'll call the next panel. David Malkins. Professor John Petropis. Ella Barnes. Kate Fletcher. Magali Regis. 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 Ingrid Weidinger. And Heather Sharp. Maya. Maya Van, Van Noor. Ronnie Wolf. Michael Green. Michael Green.
Tamara Alvarez, Carol Ashley, Sebastian Gabi, Barbara Ramsey, Julia Van Javon, Julia, Thomas Boster, Catherine Ugate, Ugate, Barbara Horn, Yvonne Brooks, Elizabeth, no, I'm sorry, Stacy Kaufman. There you go. That's four. Jordy Mark. Okay. okay. That's okay. Thank Thanks, Jordy. Uh, Stephen Clark. Clark. Tessa Grundon. Sharon Bright. Gordon Ramsey. Grace Lee. Ed Morris. Bam. Cinco. <laughs> Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. My name is Magali Regis. I am from the New York City Community Garden Coalition and I'm here in support of Elizabeth Street Garden. Every community garden is special and unique, reflecting the labor of love and hard work of the people who created it. And as a community garden advocate, I have visited hundreds of gardens, not just in New York, but around the world. And Elizabeth Street Garden stands as one of our most unique and stunning public green space, and not just in New York, but anywhere. And in a neighborhood where parks are so scarce, the garden has filled that gap, allowing those who reside there and work there nearby a necessary respite from the stress and density of urban life. And we need to do all we can to stop its destruction. 111 places in New York that you must not miss. I'm brandishing this book. Discover unexpected treasures and hidden places you never imagined you would find in New York. This is at page 78. The garden is featured. And this is not the only publication that mentions Elizabeth Street Garden. It's been in dozens of guidebooks, blogs, and websites, both national and international, as a place to visit in New York. And that is because so many has, have recognized its value. And any city in the US or in the world would be envious to have this garden. If all of its trees and plants and sculptures, birds, lawns, butterflies could easily be moved and auctioned off to the highest bidder, like an invaluable piece of art that it is, and transported elsewhere, cities around the world would be fighting to have it. New York is crying out for more green space. Sure, we need affordable housing, but not at the expense of destroying a beloved and extraordinary space that's been treasured by thousands. New York City has Central Park. Imagine if it were destroyed, what kind of city we would be. Well, for Elizabeth Street Gardens community residents, it's their Central Park, and destroying it is an act of neighborhood violence. I urge the City Council to vote no to Haven Green development and preserve the garden in, in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stacy Kaufman. I'm a constituent of uh, Margaret Chin's. I'm uh, a senior, gay, and disabled, 
And I just want to tell you how, why I'm here. And that's because one day about two years ago, my friend Jill was visiting from Northern California. And we were walking around the neighborhood. I was just showing her around New York. We were walking around the neighborhood and all of a sudden we walked down the street and there was this oasis just appeared. It was like magical. It was like a really a magical place. And, and that's why I took friends there. It's such a special place. And it, it was like shocking to me that con uh, Councilwoman Quinn, uh, uh, Chin, that you haven't even been there. It's in, your, it's in your area and that you haven't been there. I urge you, uh, Chairwoman uh, Adams, to go there and just walk down the street and see all of a sudden it appears like an oasis. It is so in incredibly special. It's so unique that please, I beg you, people say that you're going to be a rubber stamp. I beg you, you don't, you seem so wonderful and so attentive. I don't want to see you or the other members of this committee do that. I really want to see that you stand up. I know the way it usually works is that you rubber stamp the, the uh, council person whose area it is. But in this case, I mean, see for yourself and see see how it feels. I mean, the people who are the proponents of the, of the development, it seems to me for the most part, they're all paid people. We are here with our hearts. The people who are proponents are, are all people who are going to have a financial interest in, in the development. And what I'd also like to say is that they seem to say that we are people who are against affordable housing, against seniors, and I, now a new thing, deeply affordable housing. How could anyone be against deeply affordable housing? So I urge you to go visit it yourself and, and see what this is about and why people are, I, why people are so distressed about this. My name is Barbara Horn. I'm a gardener, a garden lover. I'm also a steward of the um, Albert's Garden on East 2nd Street. And I'm going to speak anecdotally and generically, but I still believe that the personal is political. It's remarkable to me, someone who has lived in the nearby East Village for 40 years and am now a senior, that this is the best that the city I love can do. To destroy an oasis, that word that we've used so frequently, one with such a special vista, open spaces, historic and artistic importance. Why would my city, our city, chop up and destroy this green meeting place of peace, tranquility, a place where we can educate and celebrate and have community spirit. For thousands and thousands of people, many seniors, there are other choices. This garden, once destroyed, is irreplaceable. The intact, unique garden grew gradually with hands and hearts and hard work. Can't our city come up with plans that don't destroy? How about dedicating one floor on every high rise to affordable housing? How unwise, shall I say irresponsible, to capture a garden, a garden, to solve affordable housing? As someone who seeks out gardens and parks daily in a city I love hourly, I ask you to take a minute to think about what you're doing, and in a New York nanosecond, you will not take down this garden. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ed Morris. I'm a philosopher of nature, and um, I'd like to open with a few dirty words. Hudson Yards. Essex Crossing, Extel Towers. There are gobs of space there, but no, 
One of the speakers said he works with the homeless on Essex Street. Well, towering above Essex Street is Essex Crossing, 22 and plus uh, stories high. Why doesn't the city show uh, compassion for the 700,000 on the waiting list? And why should it specify a uh, gender specialty as the um, entrance permit for this group? That's wrong. The whole city is crying. We've had two senior gay mayors, Koch and Blumenthal, Bloomberg, but uh, there are many, many people suffering, and the uh, 700,000 deficit should be open to all. And um, yes, there, you know, uh, Hudson Street is space, but Essex Street is a lot more. Hudson Yards is a lot more. Extel Towers is a tower. So I say that the people who would bulldoze the earth have already bulldozed their own earth, their own anima, their own feminine, their own soul. And I ask them to find their own earth first and then discover Mother Earth. There are four full-term trees in the Elizabeth Street Garden. These act as a sponge. We're in an ecological crisis. Mayor uh, uh, de Blasio was weeping tears because the Brazilian president who's bulldozing the Amazon uh, may show up in New York, but he bulldozes his own Amazon. He bulldozes the Mandela Garden, the Pleasantville Garden in East Harlem, and he bulldozes ours. But as one old lady from Chinatown told me, she said, this is my garden, and I'm going to be padlocked to the fence if they want to come. Remember, you and we are the city, not Margaret Chin and our mentor, Sheldon Silver. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of President David Malkins from the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors. The Bowery Alliance of Neighbors... The Bowery Alliance of Neighbors is a nonprofit grassroots organization working to protect residents, small businesses, um, the neighborhood, and the historic character of the Bowery. Dear Speaker Johnson and City Council members, we strongly oppose this ill-advised development plan which seeks to bulldoze one of the community's most popular and enchanting open green spaces. Proponents of the development have followed a nasty and divisive strategy of portraying this as an either-or situation, wherein you can have only, only have a garden or affordable housing. Why can't we have both, affordable housing and garden? We urge the council members to follow the very reasonable proposal made by Community Board 2, build affordable housing in one of the alternative sites, such as proposed before. Lost in all of this is the fact that the very large building adjunct to the Elizabeth Sturt's Garden South Side is Section 8, affordable housing, the residents of which will lose their lovely views and easy access to the garden as this development goes through. This situation reminds of the progressive era slogan, bread and roses. In this current situation, the community supports the basic essentials, the bread of affordable housing, but also wants the roses, the beautiful things, such as this enchanting garden green space. The Elizabeth Street Garden is one of the little Italy area's few open green spaces. A jewel in this community, it brings joy to residents and tourists and contrib contributes to the allure, value, and economic vitality of the community. Thank you to the many elected officials who have supported the garden's preservation. We urge the community council members to reject this development plan and instead support CB2's smart and reasonable alternative plan to have the affordable housing project built at an alternative site. Build affordable housing, but do not destroy this beautiful green garden space. Give us bread, but also give us roses. And I personally want to note that um, I was homeless and um, I have been, um, I, I'm part of the LGBTQ community and I don't think there's like an either or necessary. And I, I host a um, weekly meetup um, group with almost 300 members at the garden for over two years with um, members who are 82 years old and also kids. And those are like twice the amount of numbers, uh, members of like the survey has of the um, Habitat for Humanity. So um, I, I think there's a strong support. There's thousands of people who volunteer to help them, and there's no paid people to do that. We all love the garden and the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your passion on the issue today and for being here. Really appreciate it.
Thank you. All right, we're winding down. We're going to do it this way. Uh, is there anyone in the room who has signed up to speak and has not yet spoken? What's your name? Allison Smith. Come on up. What's your name, sir? Thomas O'Neill. Anyone else? I'm going to repeat one more time. Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify on these items today? Okay. Ooh, you may begin. Hi, I'm Allison Smith. Um, I represent University Settlement. Um, I also represent uh, about 80 community members that couldn't be here through a petition that I brought. Um, with over 200,000 low-income seniors and on affordable housing wait lists for an average of seven years, the Haven Green Project is a compromise that allows New York City to prioritize our most vulnerable neighbors and open green space. The elder population is growing more rapidly than other segments of the city's residents, rising over 26% in the last 10 years. Currently, over 200,000 low-income seniors are on waiting lists for senior housing. 5,000 of those seniors waiting are in our local community. University Settlements Housing Protection Program, Project Home, sees this crisis firsthand. Over 750 neighbors with housing crises come to us each year, including over 105 households over the year near the proposed Haven Green site, and over 60% of those are seniors. Projects like Haven Green are an important part of the solution to this crisis. The Haven Green project is a compromise to the greater good and preserves 8,000 square feet of open and public space. It's important to note that there's also a large public park two blocks away with active neighbors and invested organizations like ours who welcome more volunteers. The incredible energy of the, Liz of the Elizabeth Street Garden supporters would be invaluable in volunteering and continuing to improve our community. We recognize the feeling of loss that the gardeners will have as the garden changes significantly. And we hope that they and you on the council also share the deep loss of those neighbors who lost their apartments on Elizabeth Street when we could not save them from landlord harassment, rising rents, and lack of physical accessibility as they grew older. These apartments and the 123 new neighbors of Haven Green will house will bring an incredible benefit to the community. We don't dispute the need for green space, but even higher on the priority list is safe, affordable housing. Hello, my name is Tom O'Neill. I was born and raised in New York City, son of immigrants, shopped in Orchard Street during the 1970s, attended NYU in the 1980s. I support low-income housing, but I do not support the Haven Green development project. I support the preservation of the Elizabeth Street uh, Garden. I, I often relax in the garden during the year, particularly in the spring, summer, and fall. I live on Green Street off Grand. There are very few relaxing places left in the neighborhood where you can be at peace. As I said, I went to NYU in the 80s, and Soho was a very different place back then. At the time, you had about 30 million annual visitors to New York City in comparison to over 60 million today. As you know, many of these visitors find their way down to Soho. In addition, the population of the city was 7 million in around 1990. It's now 8.5 million, million people. Um, so crowding is an issue. In addition, most of the vacant lots in the city are, uh, downtown are now gone. There were a couple dozen when I moved into the neighborhood 15 years ago. The Hudson Square neighborhood used to be a quiet refuge place for me, but even that has been developed at a rapid place. Uh, in summary, uh, Soho residents need the Elizabeth Street Garden. Many Soho residents are frustrated with the crowds and overdevelopment in the neighborhood. I'd like to make a few other points. There's something wrong uh, with a city where some of our elected officials are receiving campaign dollars from national real estate developers like Toll Brothers. Shame on you. Uh, the city should be run by a, a administrators who are more uh, who are not influenced by these out, outside influences there's something wrong with a city which allows dozens of luxury towers to be built with unoccupied apartments owned by limited liability corporations while a low income housing crisis persists 
There is something wrong with a city which allows retail stores to remain vacant without a vacancy tax. A vacancy tax would encourage businesses that actually serve the residents of the neighborhood, like delis, bodegas, coffee shops, etc. And there's something wrong with a city that is destroying open spaces like the Elizabeth Street Garden. I would encourage the government officials here to look at the words of Lincoln above me, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Thank you. We've expressed much support for the garden. You should listen to what the people are saying over Thank the past you for six your testimony. years. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today. Seeing no additional members of the public wishing to testify on this matter, the public hearing on pre-considered LU Haven Green Senior Housing is now closed, and that concludes today's hearing. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, ABLE Council, Land Use Staff, and our great security team for your attendance here today. This meeting is hereby adjourned.